We'll see how many folks are here with us today. All right, um, Don, have you joined us yet? Don Motner, Vice Chair. Let's circle back to Don. I'm not sure she's here yet. Um, Greg, I see you here. Good morning. Well, good morning, welcome. And Chicky, I see you here too. Good morning and welcome. Andy, are you here with us this morning? It looks like Andy might have just hopped on. Andy, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Welcome. Kimberly, I see you are here. Good, Good morning. morning. All right, Sean, I see you're here too. Good morning. Good morning. Don, our vice chair, I see you're here. Good morning. Good morning. And um, is Representative Nose here? I have not seen him yet. He may not be here. Uh, Siobhan, he said he would try and join as much as he could. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for that update, Rose. All right, um, thank you all for being here. We have quorum, that means we can approve the minutes. Um, there was a minor correction to the minutes that Rose shared with all of us. So we have the updated version and do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, this is Greg, I can make a motion to approve the minutes as written. Okay, great, thanks Greg. Do I have a second? Second. I'll second. It's Andy. Okay. I had both Sean and Andy second. Let's go oh. with Sean. She, he was there a minute before. Second. Second. No before problem. Andy. Uh, Greg and then Sean is our second. Um, Dawn, how do you vote? Approve. Thank you. Chicky, how do you vote? I approve. Thank you. Andy, I know you're going to second. So how do you vote? <laughs> I vote yay. Okay, thank you. Kimberly, how do you vote? Approve. All right, thank you. And thank you, Greg and Sean. The motion has passed. So we are going to move forward and talk about our communication plan for PEB open enrollment. And I believe we have Aaron Ward and Cindy Bowman who are going to be presenting for us. Yep, thank you. All right, thank Hi, you. Everyone. Yeah. Hi, everyone. This is Erin Ward uh, from Mercer. Um, Cindy is also going to be presenting with me, but she's having um, she's having issues logging into Teams, so she is on her phone. So, um, so for today, if we can go to the next slide, we are going to take a look at the um, open enrollment communications at a glance. We'll look at the timing and the different pieces that will be happening, um, and then we're going to take a closer look at the digital tools that will be available for open enrollment this year. Um, and we have four there listed that um, I'll be able to show you some screenshots of. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Cindy to talk about the timing um, and the different pieces. So that's on the next slide. All right, we heard you were having some issues this morning. Cindy, if you're talking, I'm not hearing anything. Are others hearing anything? No. I Oh, uh, I am on now we hear you. On phone. Yeah. I'm there you go. Just, I'm just by phone right now. Sorry. Um, and I can't see the slides or anything. I don't know. My team just crashed. So um, if you give me a second, I can pull it up. Erin, you're on the phone. I am. Oh, and on. if you want me to start, yep, I can start walking through everything. If you want to then jump in with commentary, uh, that's fine. OK, that'd be beautiful. Thank hey, you. So yeah, sorry, no everyone. wonders. Yeah, um, so you can see a timeline here where we have all the dates laid out. You can see the months running from left to right. So we have August, September, October, and then post enrollment. So November, December, January on the far right. Um, so in August, so the current month, uh, we're looking to send out two different um, open enrollment related communications. The first is a summary of changes, and that will be going to, or that will be available for key stakeholders. Um, and we're targeting to have that available in mid August. Um, we're also going to be sending out an email around the dependent eligibility verification process, and that timing is targeted for end of August. Um, moving into September, there's a number of things happening in September gearing up for open enrollment here. Um, so there will be um, an email about HEM and starting um, the activities that are required to participate in HEM. That will happen in early September. 
Uh, there will be a sneak peek newsletter. It's an email that will go out to members that will be sent through Gov Delivery. Um, and this is where members will really get to see um, a preview of the changes that are happening for the 2024 plan year. Um, so the target for that sneak peek newsletter will be mid-September. Um, we're also um, at that same time I'm planning to have the premium estimator tool available for members. Um, the plan should be that we would link to it from the sneak peek, um, but that premium estimator tool is a tool that was available um, a couple years ago, and um, there were some issues with the site, so um, Mercer has um, helped reimagine that site and make it available um, for members. It is one of the more requested items from members, so we're excited to have that tool available for everyone again. Um, at the same, we'll also be going live with the virtual benefits fair. Um, and so that's where everyone can take a, you know, go on to the fair and learn about the benefits. There will also be webinars from the vendor partners as part of that that you can access through the auditorium. So that should also be live in mid-September. Um, there will be a webinar for administrators and, and uh, around pay, payroll information for open enrollment. The target for that is mid-September. And Cindy, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add about that webinar. Um, this one here is um, for season administrators. And are you talking about the admin and payroll? Yeah. Or did you move? Yeah. 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 Nope. That's um, that just kind of gives them a background of, of what to expect during open enroll enrollment and kind of the timeline um, and things they need to know on the admin side. So it's very different from the core benefits open enrollment webinar. Thank you. Um, so moving then to that last item in September, um, well, right before open enrollment begins at the end of September, there will be an email um, about open enrollment reminding people that it's starting October 1st. Um, and as part of that, well, there will be links to the um, open enrollment page on the PEB website um, with the open enrollment and tools information. Um, the benefits guide will also be available through that. Um, there's also the summary of benefits, which is that um, PDF um, that compares the medical dental and vision plans, um, and then links also to the carrier health assessments, which is part of um, participating in HEM. Um, so that is again targeted for end of September. So then if we move into October, um, now we're into open enrollment with open enrollment running from October 1st to October 31st. Um, and again, there'll be a number of things that happen during that month. Um, first will be an open enrollment is open email and that will happen on October 1st, so day one of open enrollment. Um, Explore Your Benefits is one of the new digital tools that will be available, and so we're planning to feature that um, at the beginning of October. That's one of the tools I'll um, show you some screenshots of in just a few minutes, so you'll be able to see that. Um, we also will have a digital plan comparison tool available starting October 1st, and that is basically a, a digital version of the summary of benefits. So you'll be able to look at your medical, dental, and vision plans and compare different plans, different services. Um, and so I'll show you some a preview of what that will look like in a few minutes. Um, there will also be the open enrollment uh, and the core benefits webinar that's traditionally traditionally done. That um, has not been scheduled yet, but the target timing is for early October for members. Um, and then there will be the FSA and commuter accounts webinar, also targeted for early October. Um, and then throughout the open enrollment period, there will be reminder emails that are going to be sent out each Wednesday. So then moving to the so, last, oh, sorry, please. So um, I, so there's a, a couple things I just wanted to comment on before you move into post open sure. enrollment. Sure. Um, first, I wanna recognize Representative Gnosis here. Welcome, um, thank you for joining us. And um, on the open enrollment piece, one of the areas that we've had discussions as a board around is um, dental access. And um, we flagged that, um, Willamette Dental, it's been an issue for people in some of the counties. Um, Coos, Curry, Douglas, this continues to come up. People have to drive quite a ways. Is there a plan to make sure that um, there's communication with people? So if they make the choice to go with Willamette in areas where there's very limited access, they know that they have to travel. Because I know with our health carriers, 
it's already baked in because people put in their zip code and then they see what's available, but that's not what happens with dental. And so, you know, we want to make sure folks in rural areas or for in places where there's less access, they make an educated decision around this. Um, so, uh, Siobhan, uh, we um, actually have a meeting with uh, the Mercer Communications team tomorrow afternoon, and that is on the agenda for us to talk about a strategy. And, of course, we want to work with Willamette, and definitely we will communicate out to members um, so they're aware uh, for sure. So we just we don't we're, we're going to discuss it tomorrow afternoon and we can share those plans with you. OK, great. I appreciate that. Um, and then the other piece, if and and you may need to comment on this later, too, um, because there's been. Issues or stressors with workday, just, um, you know, you're going to have an estimator, right, um, for people's benefits. And we've you know, had feedback that sometimes things on workday don't line up with um, PEB estimates. So just a, a flag that all those kinks need to be worked through or they cause more uh, confusion. So uh, go ahead, Cindy. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, so it is a challenge and it's a challenge for us too because we really don't have control over what's happening in Workday. Um, the estimator tool is based on, um, and, and Aaron, you can probably speak much more articulately than I can, but it's really based on um, the rates that that have been agreed upon. And and um, as you, as Aaron goes through it, you can kind of see how it works. Um, I I do know that we had an issue um, that was brought to Barry's attention where what was happening in Workday didn't really match what was supposed to be happening, and so. Um, that is a challenge for us, and unfortunately, we don't have a ton of control over it because it's it's a DAF workday issue. So, um, anyway, I don't. Yeah, I appreciate. Answer, no, I appreciate that you don't control the the what's happening on workday. It's just more we we know it's an issue, so um, yeah. I just want to flag yeah. it. <laughs> uh, and then, Chicky, I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Thank you, Shawan. Um, so I'm looking at this communication set of glass and, and it looks very thorough and very robust. I was just curious if um, texting was explored and if it was vetoed for any reason. Um, we have offered text um, texting in the past and on a voluntary basis. Um, and people just, we had like 400 members maybe. Uh, uh, sign up for it. It hasn't just hasn't been a huge um, and we don't also don't have a really great texting service um, at this point. Erin, can you talk because we discussed that as part of our communication strategy. Yeah, I also believe um, I believe like the instructions for signing up were were confusing and there were some issues around that. But I think ultimately because of the low participation when it's been offered in the past, we have not continued it. But um, certainly something we can explore again or um, maybe even other ways to to provide that service. OK, yeah, so just from the marketplace side, I know that it's becoming a high value. Tool. And if you need a tool that you could use, um, I definitely can connect you to marketplace resources for texting. But I completely understand the whole opt in versus opt out. Part of me wonders because a lot of them are um, public employees. If maybe there's an automatic opt in because you're there, you know, we're sending numbers to work numbers versus personal numbers. So that might be another angle. Just another tool to get attention because open enrollment is only 31 days, so that's not a whole lot of time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Chicky, uh, definitely, we'd we'd like to know the resource that the marketplace uses, um, so we can connect later. And um, because our tool was really cumbersome and and not very efficient, so that'd be great. Sounds good, Cindy. I'll have um, somebody from my team reach out to you as well. Wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, I've made note of that, so we'll talk more about that because that would be great. Any other questions or comments? Right. 
Um, so then just to cover off on that last column there, so post-enrollment, um, so there will be an email that goes out in early November around the corrections period. Um, there will be um, a mailer to homes around um, FSAs. Um, um, also a webinar about understanding your FSAs in mid-November, um, another corrections email that comes out in early December, um, another FSA email reminder in early December, and then in early January, there's an email checking your pay stub since the um, 2024 plan year has begun, um, and the, you would see those deductions on your first pay stub. Cindy, anything to add on, on any of the timing? I don't think so. All right. Um, so then I'll move um, into the um, some of the digital tools. So we have four different tools to just show you some screenshots of. Um, the first is the premium estimator tool. Um, so like I said, that we're bringing this back. Um, it had been available a couple years ago, um, and there were issues with that tool. So it, um, it's been, um, at, we're calling it reimagined, um, but it definitely took the tool that had been available to PEB members um, and have um, updated it for, for to be available for 2020. Um, now, what you're seeing on the right-hand side is a screenshot of that summary um, of that summary table. Um, but ultimately, members will be able to go through this tool um, and determine their estimated monthly deduc deductions for their PEB benefits. Um, it includes all the PEB benefits, so everything from healthcare to savings accounts. Um, we've also included tool tips throughout, so that as you're talking about a specific benefit, um, you can read some information about that benefit and then potentially also link to the PEB website to be able to find more information about that specific benefit. Um, and then it can be used, it's going to be available year round, so certainly can be available during open enrollment or if someone were ha um, had a qualified status change and needed it after that. Um, but what you can see in the screenshot here is um, along the top um, in the blue bar, you can see there's a welcome message. So when you first land on the screen, there's a welcome message and you have to acknowledge that, yes, you know, this is an estimator, that this is, you know, not may not be exact um, and that this is for estimating purposes only. So once you accept that, um, then you come into the tool um, and then you can see those gray tabs. So there's one for basic information where you enter like your location, your zip code, also your monthly salary, things like that information. Um, and then that information is used to create the um, information that's shown to you. As you move through the tabs, there's the core benefits. So you can choose what medical plans you want, what coverage levels, dental vision and coverage levels. You move into life and disability, you can choose if you want those coverages, um, coverage amounts, et cetera. Um, for spending and commuter accounts, that's where you would indicate if you wanted to contribute to like an FSA or to one of the parking accounts. Um, and then tab five, it's, it says surcharges up on the um, on this screenshot. We've, we've actually changed that to miscellaneous now, um, but that is where you can enter information about the different surcharges. You know, uh, I'm a smoker, I'm not a smoker, my spouse, um, do you have double coverage, that kind of thing. Um, and then when you move to the final tab, um, you can see um, all of this, the summary that's down below. Um, you can see that you'll be able to see the summary in two different views. You can see the graph summary here, which you can see with the orange and the green bars, um, but you also then can see the details down below in the table. Um, and you'll be able to click into those different, where you see the plus signs uh, next to like core benefits or life and disability benefits. You'll be able to click those open and see the details about how that sec the deductions for that section um, look. Um, so there, I think there's a lot of flexibility within the tool, people can play with it um, and really have a chance to, to see what different benefit elections would look like and how it would impact their paycheck. So any questions about this tool? Um, I want to note, Siobhan, just related to your comment about, um, um, sorry, I just lost it. Okay. I apologize. Um, Thank you so much. I was thinking that we could potentially add in um, a disclaimer about Workday or add some information on the welcome screen or maybe an FAQ about it as well so that we can proactively address that um, or at least make note of it on the site. So that's something that we can certainly add um, as part of the development. So, and thank you. All right, so if there's no questions on this one, I'll move to the next tool. So the next I have a tool is about that. Oh, yeah, please. Mm, 
Actually, I'll hold it until we are done presenting. We'll okay. Right. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this tool here is what we're calling Explore Your Benefits, um, and it, it, it's an interactive benefits learning tool. Um, so you can see several different screenshots up on your screen here, um, but it's essentially a simulated like benefits video game um, with different modules that members can use uh, or can move through um, to learn more about PEBS benefits and the wellness programs. Um, we've tried to make it fun. Um, there's videos throughout, there's different games that can be played, um, and as you move through you you know you've noted yes you visited this section you can also earn wellness badges um, that doesn't bring you any kind of prize other than you've completed this section but um, really trying to create a fun and interactive way for people to learn more about their benefits um, in the the screenshot in the top right um, is our home page map um, so this is the the screen the screen from which you can enter into the different modules. Um, so you can see them there. There's medical, dental, vision, disability, life, and AD and D insurance. And then we have three sections on different well-being benefits. Um, so you can navigate through that different map. When you go into a section, um, a video starts. Um, so uh, an overview video about that benefit. Um, and then after you move through the video, then you can see the screenshot in the bottom right corner. That's a content section. Um, so from there where you can enter uh, and find more information about the different vendor partners um, or also enter uh, into the games and play the games um, to learn more in, um, that way. Um, so this is uh, really just intended to be a fun way to learn about um, PEBS benefits. So, um, and then this is go live. The go live target is October 1st when open enrollment begins. All right, so I'll move to the next tool on the next page. Thank you. Uh, so this is uh, the virtual benefits fair. Um, so we have had the, the virtual benefits fair available for the last two years. So this will be the third year for the virtual benefits fair. Um, so members can enter into the fair um, and really find all, all you need about uh, your PEB benefits. There are vendor partner booths that you can enter into, and then that information has been provided by the different vendor partners. Um, so there's different PDFs or presentations, podcasts, and webinars to be able to access. You'll also find links to the vendor partner sites. Um, and for many of the vendors, we are working on um, doing, uh, being able to schedule one-on-one -on -one appointments with the vendor partner. So we'll use something like Sign Up Genius to be able to, um, for someone to be able to sign up for a one-on-one -on -one appointment with their vendor partner. Um, there's the auditorium there where you can enter and see all the different videos that are created by both PEB and the vendor partners. Uh, we have a wellness resource center where we're planning to highlight um, the different services available by Canopy or Beyond Benefits, also Healthy You and Weight Watchers. Um, we're also building this year a new emotional well-being uh, center. Um, since that continues to be a, a, a topic, we want to make sure that content's available on. Um, so you'll see that in a different room for that. So it's targeted just to emotional well-being services and programs. Um, and then there's also an enrollment center. So you can see that screenshot at the very bottom. So uh, that will link out to Alex. It will link to the premium estimator tool. It will link to explore your benefits. So um, you'll be able to get to those resources from there. So we are targeting to have this live in mid-September. And then last but not least, on the next page, we have the digital comparison tool. Um, and essentially, we'll be taking the, that PDF that ha is, has a summary of the different medical, dental, and vision plans, and we'll be creating a digital version of that. Um, with the digital version, you'll be able to um, it will initially show you all the plans, but then you can potentially, you know, uh, remove some of the plans. So maybe you just want to look at, you know, this Kaiser plan versus this Providence plan, or um, so you can, you know, get it down to just those two columns. So you're only looking at the, you know, those specific plans. You also are able to add or remove services. So if you wanted to just look at, you know, deductibles, you could um, close off the different services. So you're just looking at the specific services you want. Um, so it will include, like I said, medical, dental, and vision and you'll have the ability to be able to um, you know open and close the different plans or services that you want to take a look at um, so we are targeting to have this ready and available for October 1st when open enrollment begins and one thing I wanted to say just about all four of the of the tools that we mentioned oh, 
actually, sorry, not for the premium estimator tool at this time, but um, there will be Spanish versions of the Explore Your Benefits tool, of the Virtual Benefits Fair, and of the Digital Plan Comparison tool. So um, people will have the option to be able to see that in English and Spanish. Um, and Cindy, I'm not sure that we've talked about Spanish for the premium estimator tool, but something I think we should certainly be working towards um, as well. I agree, yeah. So any, oh, yep, Chicky, you have a question? Thank you for having the tools available in Spanish as well. Quick question, will the, especially the premium estimator tool and explore your benefits tool, will these, will you have mobile responsive um, versions? Yes, um, all of them are built to be mobile, um, mobile responsive. So um, you should be able to access it. You will be able to access it from both your mobile phone or a, a tablet, as well as your computer. Perfect. And then um, it's a more of a request, not a question. I would love a badge to put in my signature line to maybe promote to um, employees about, especially the Explorer Benefits tool. Is that mm -hmm. the tool available to board members, or maybe if we, if we could even pull in a few. Um, benefits ambassadors um, for PEB and OWEB, I, I, I think that would be a great idea. So if you have something that I can put in my signature line, I think that would be fantastic. Season, yeah. thank you. No, I think that's a great idea. Yep. Thank you for that. And then Don, did you have a question or comment? The question that I had was about the um, who participated in developing these? They seem amazing to me. They are. They seem to be meeting what I would consider to be sort of needs and opportunities to make the information accessible and engaging and uh, do a good job of giving people different ways to access um, uh, all the different information that can help them make an informed decision. The question that I had about that was in developing them, what kind of participation did the Mercer team have um, with sort of the communities who are the who are the target communities or prioritized communities, those who have been highly impacted by inequities, people who um, with lived experience, people who might be able to provide perspective on how to get that information to their communities in ways that we um, that we haven't done as well in the past, sort of that constellation of, of questions in terms of how the tools were developed and centering equity. Thanks. And Cindy, do you want to take that or do you want me to take it? Well, I can certainly uh, start and then maybe you can join in. Mm -hmm. um, the Mercer team, I just need to give a shout out to them because these tools uh, these amazing tools, I think, um, were created with a little bit of input, well, maybe more than a little bit of input from our communications staff, but really the, the Mercer communications team and their uh, digital par digital partners um, in the background have, have created these tools, um, and we're really very proud of them. Um, in answer to your, your question, uh, Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have not really, um, we have, I think those are great suggestions and we need to talk about how we can um, maybe pilot the tools with um, underserved communities. We, I, Aaron, unless I am mistaken, we haven't, we didn't really do that in the development of the tools themselves, but I think um, we have opportunities to enhance the tools for sure. Um, yeah, I, I agree. we did not. Yeah, agreed. We did not pilot the tools um, with any specific groups, but we did host um, focus groups um, about was it two years ago? Um, and a lot of the um, uh, requests or suggestions that came out of those focus groups um, were incorporated into this into these tools and what people were looking for. We did also um, make sure that we had an accessibility review of each of the tools to ensure that we were, um, you know, the colors are good and the um, pictures are, you know, all of those, all of the things that should be incorporated into a website have been incorporated. So, um, so we have been, you know, we've gotten feedback from different pieces, um, but we have not done 
any kind of specific piloting. Um, but I do think that's a great idea and something, you know, that we should think about, Cindy, for um, going forward. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Any other comments or questions? Don, are you going to say something else? All right. Well, thank you both, um, Aaron and um, Cindy. I appreciate that overview. And we are going to go ahead and move to our next presentation. We have Canopy EAP with us, Umberto Chacon and Julie Marshall. Hello, everyone. I'm Umberto Chacon, uh, Customer Success Manager from Canopy for the state of Oregon. And I have my colleague here, Julie Marshall. You can say hi, Julie. Morning. Hello. Good morning. Good <laughs> to see you all. Who's our COO? You can go to the next slide, actually, and then that's a picture of us. Go to the next one, if you would. So we'll go over various things today. Uh, we'll talk about utilization. Talk about some new things. Um, you know, our plans, uh, options have uh, increased. So we'll give you some information about that, and we'll look ahead at what else is coming for canopies, and we'll have some time for Q and A. So if you can go to the next slide. So our mission is to create happier, healthier futures by breaking down barriers for people today. So we're doing our bit to try to help people work through things, through life events, through issues that they're dealing with so that they can feel better and move on. Go to the next slide. I want to show you some information, some data about PEB uh, members experience and then we'll go into our services and whatnot, but uh, this is data regarding PEB members. So we answer our phones 24 uh, seven by a uh, mental health professional and it's within 10 seconds. It's actually less than 10 seconds that we answer the phone 24 uh, seven for folks. And the time to first appointment taking in preferences of the members uh, to a counselor, it's six and a half days. So that's how long it takes uh, on average. And then if someone is looking to speak with a uh, coach, it's actually just 1.5 days, one and a half days until they get to uh, speak with a coach. We can go to the next slide. I want to show you a little bit more data. So um, we do a pre and a post assessment, so a psychometrically valid assessment that looks at workplace outcomes. And for PEB members, uh, what we've seen is that three out of five report that absenteeism, absenteeism has decreased for them. Uh, their focus, uh, one out of three, has increased. And something that's hard to move the needle on is life satisfaction. 16% of them have reported that their life satisfaction has increased. We can go to the next slide. So here's our service summary. This is something that's uh, going to be posted on the virtual benefits, benefits fair. Um, so on the left are all the mental health, uh, kind of mental well-being services that we provide. So we have a 24-7 mental health hotline. If people call the 800 number down at the bottom. You know, like I said, it's always picked up by a mental health professional. We can provide in the moment phone support consultations right then and there. If someone has a pressing need or if someone needs to get to safety, we can help them uh, right then and there. And we have counseling. So you know, we did have uh, three or five counseling session options. And then this year we've gone to three, five, six, and eight. And we'll show some data as to what agencies are uh, choosing. And then we have behavioral coaches. So that doesn't take away from the counseling session. So the same number of coaching sessions as the number of counseling sessions are provided uh, for members, whatever their agency uh, chose. And then something new, and we'll talk a little bit about this, is virtual peer support with our partner uh, supportive. So that's another 24 seven um, option that people have. And uh, we have some early day data to share with you about that. And then over on the right are all the resources for life. So we can help members with finding child care, elder care. Uh, we have a resource retrieval team that can do searches for all sorts of different things, like maybe finding a vet for their pet or an apartment or just various things. We can help members save time, do some of the legwork for them. Uh, and then we also have uh, financial coaches. So unlimited financial coaching, uh, not 
selling any products or anything, just providing information so the member can make a financial decision and then also provide digital tools if that's appropriate. So maybe around building credit, major purchase, retirement, uh, various types of uh, topics. And then we also have a nationwide network of attorneys and all this is available nationwide. Uh, and the first 30 minutes with the attorney is no charge. After that, it's a 25% discount off of the attorney's normal rate. Also have fraud resolution specialists that can help with recovering uh, a member's ID. So we can help somebody through that process or that very stressful time consuming process. Uh, we also have a partnership with a fertility health clinic that provides um, a fertility health credit, uh, can help with family building resources and uh, help them through that journey. Also have a home ownership program. Quite a few state of Oregon employees uh, contact us to connect with our partner on that to save money on mortgages. Um, and then we also have pet insurance and gym membership discounts. So people, are, especially now, people are definitely looking for ways to save some save some money. And we have a member site. Uh, we'll show you just a screenshot of that, but over 20,000 resources on that member site. Uh, there are videos, links, calculators, uh, self-paced courses, on-demand uh, webinars that we've recorded, all sorts of different uh, topics. And then we have our proprietary Whole Life Directions app, which is a digital cognitive behavioral therapy app. So that's available to PEB members as well. So quite a bit uh, for members. We'll talk a little bit also about for the organization and for HR managers, but uh, this is for members. We can go to the next slide. So um, we're still waiting to hear from a few agencies about what counseling um, number of sessions that they like to have. But uh, so far what we're seeing is that 37 of the agencies remained at three sessions, 48 remained at five, and then something that's interesting to note is that a total of eight uh, agencies have gone uh, up to eight sessions. Uh, so still waiting to hear, but want to just show you that uh, some of the agencies are choosing to go for either six or eight, which was a new set of options uh, for them this year. We can go to the next slide. So uh, when people call us, you know, we go through an assessment and a triage. We speak to the member about uh, their situation, what they're looking for, and then also look for um, kind of the acuity level, the level of need. We also do that on our virtual care navigator, which Julie will talk a little bit about in, in just a bit, minute. But we go from kind of high to medium to low acuity. So on the high side, we have the mental health hotline. As I mentioned, you know, mental health professionals answering the phone 24 seven. Then we have counseling. We also have the new virtual peer support. We have the coaches and then we have the resources for life, you know, like financial, legal, child care, that sort of thing. We also have a well-being bot. So that's a text based um, set of answers to people's questions. And then on the low acuity side, we have all the self help resources, all those items on the member site or whole life directions. So just want to show you that we have a virtual care navigator that emulates the call in uh, kind of experience for people and we custom um, you know we put together a custom care package for each um, member so personalized recommendations for them um it looks like, it we, looks have like a we have question. a question yes yeah go ahead uh, i can wait until after the okay. presentation oh wait okay sounds good thank you you can go to the next slide so like to is pass this, it on to Julie. Talk oh, okay. About I was like, that. I thought this is mine. Correct. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, just talking a little bit about our provider panel, um, which is really important in terms of um, access and the service to members. And so, you know, that top left box shows we can match somebody with any of those criteria. So we collect this information from our providers and our database also allows us to then match that based on what the members needs are so their language ethnicity the age of the counselor um, the lgbtqia plus you know and, and on that one it could be either the counselor identifies as part of that community or they all and or they also have that specialty in working with that population um, uh, clinical specialties like racial tra trauma 
religion, the accessibility of the office, um, and then experience with specific populations, um, frontline workers. So including um, healthcare and um, public safety and that type of thing. Um, diversity is very important. Um, right now, our panel has um, 39% uh, of BIPOC and then 43% of the LGBTQI QIA+. Um, you know, our retention and our recruitment of our providers is very important. We've doubled our provider staff over the last year and a half to help us with that recruitment. We have about a 95 retention, not 95 percent retention rate for our provider panel, um, which is very important. We do a lot of things in addition to trying to get them on our panel. We want to retain them on our panel, so we do a lot of pieces of that. We added about 15 percent more providers um, each year. That number goes up um, because that's a real important piece in terms of adding those providers. And it's been more challenging over the last few years, as you all know. Uh, as we move into this demand around mental health and, and lower providers. R rural Oregon, I know, is a, is a um, you know, focus and concern in terms of access. And um, if we don't have a provider nearby that fits the criteria that that member needs, our provider panel works to recruit. Um, and we also use um, that telehealth as well. That's been very helpful, both for access throughout the state. And so that's a something that we've used um, extensively to help us with access. So the next slide. So this slide is a video, actually. It's a 90 second video that we wanted to show you that really gives you some an idea of kind of how that counseling referral process works rather than me try to describe it to you and shows a little bit behind the scenes. Um, and I think you should be able to play it with the I, link on there. Is that I think right? It actually doesn't on the PDF. So oh. what I'll do is I'll send I'll send a link for anyone who wants oh, to watch okay. that 90 second video. So okay. I'll follow. We won't mess with Thanks. sharing our screen. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's, it just, is, it's a placeholder for now. Yeah, so it is a nice video that we produce it because people are asking like, you know, how are people getting matched up with their services? And we do a lot of things, that stat that Umberto showed you around that six and a half days. We work hard for that six and a half days and have a lot of staff concentrated on that. Um, because we want to make sure people get matched and have that first appointment. That's not just when they get assigned a counselor. That's when they are sitting in that office from the time they call to the time their appointment is at six and a half days. And so we monitor that weekly to make sure that we're hitting that target and have a whole team staff devoted to that case once that member calls in to make sure that that match happens. So that member experience kind of gives you a peek into that. So we can go to the next slide. So the the member site, or we call it now the member hub, it's had this last, um, well, I think the end of last year, we unveiled kind of a whole redesign of it in terms of really helping make it more intuitive in terms of the navigation. Um, most, it can be, um, users can turn it into translate it to almost any language now. Um, so it makes it a lot more accessible. And as and as um, Umberto mentioned, it has just thousands. There's self-assessments, there's videos, there's quizzes, all of those resources that are on there. There's a whole supervisor management section. And so it's really a great wealth of information that's curated and um, updated constantly. Um, and then the information there around accessing it. Um, so if we go to the next slide, <coughs> one of the biggest changes um, that we've done is incorporating what's called a virtual care navigator that Umberto mentioned. And when somebody first goes onto the site, they are given this explanatory welcome screen. They can go out of it very easily and just move on to the site if that's what they want. But the idea is to really help them as they're trying to navigate all the services, you know, that long list of services that Umberto showed you, it can be kind of overwhelming or even they may not even know what's there for them. So if they want to get that rec those recommendations based on their needs, they can get their plan now, which is what that button is right there. And um, so it takes them through an assessment. If you go to the next slide, it, if they're on, it's you know mobile um, optimized. So if they're on the phone, it looks kind of like a chat, like a text 
um, conversation and they're just taken through questions. It first is asking them if they want some emotional care or if they want those resources for life either way and then takes them based on what they're saying through some questions. For the emotional care ones, it's really looking at kind of what the acuity is for them. Um, and we also are uh, using the PHQ and for depression and the GAD for anxiety so that we can use this for some outcomes measurements as well. And so once they take this assessment and go through that and it measures that acuity, like I said, and also what their focus is and why they're accessing um, EAP services, you can go to the next slide. It's gonna show them what their plan is based on how they answered those questions. So you can see here, this person that took their um, <coughs> that assessment, the number one recommendation for them based on that is counseling. Um, and then they also have um, maybe some financial issues and then there might be some things on the website that, that, that it was assessed would be helpful for them. And any of these, when they click on that, it's gonna take them to a direct access to that service. So for instance, for the counseling, um, it's gonna take them right to where they can start scheduling online. Um, within about, I would say four weeks, it's going to take people into a scheduling portal where they'll be able to search for providers on their own based on all those specialties I talked about um, and geography and those types of things and even start that scheduling process with the counselor without even having any of our staff um, involved other than the monitoring we do of the sessions. So um, they can have that direct access to counseling for those resources for life. Um, they're able to now have direct access to that as well. And they don't have to call us. They can just go online, talk about what those services are they want. If they want a financial or a legal consultation, they're able to start that process, the scheduling. If they're wanting resources, um, they can access online. A lot of people aren't wanting to call. They just want to be able to do it online. So we actually had an explosion of our resource retrieval team got hit when we unveiled this without even really advertising it and uh, they increased by over a third um, in terms of how many uh, resource retrievals we've had. So it shows us that it really, I think it did two things. It made that access easier. So people, you know, it just put a barrier down, but I also think it made people more aware of that benefit that they might not have before. And so I think that accounts for the um, increase. And just in the first six months of 2023, um, PEB members set up 600 different plans that they've accessed. So they're aware of it, people are using it, um, and it's a great way for people to access the benefit. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So we're kind of segueing into kind of some utilization and looking at um, PEB members and, and um, how much they're using the benefit. So to give you kind of a, a context, the industry average for EAP usage is 5%. That's consistently gone up for a long time. It stayed at that three and a half, and now it's 5%, which is good. People are being more aware of that mental health benefit. For Canopy, our book of business, the average is 8%. And then for PEB, you all this last year have been at eight and a half percent, which is good. And go to the next slide. And we have a so question look from representative notes. Oh, yeah, yeah. You saw that. Of course, I didn't see it. Thank you. Oh, that's OK. I um, first of all, I'm really enjoying this presentation. And um, <coughs> excuse me, um, do you know what the. I think there's this thing in the culture right now where everybody's talking about mental health in a way that we didn't prior to the pandemic. Do you have the ability to tell me maybe off the top of your head what your utilization was prior to the pandemic, just so I can make a comparison in my brain? Yeah. Um, in terms of when you look, if you go back to that slide, if you just look at that utilization, I, I think that's held, um, and I'll let Umberto speak to this mm -hmm. too. He's more on the account management side. Um, it's held more... It, well, well, Umberto, can you, will you yeah, do, have you seen a difference? I'll let you on the account management side. Yeah, so it actually, before the pandemic, it was close to 8%. Okay. Um, and, but I think what we've seen is that maybe the acuity is a little, little higher now. So some of the situations are a little more serious, right? So um, utilization has gone up and it is trending up slightly. 
um, but also kind of the nature of the situations. It's a little little more acute for for people. Yeah, I also just observed that the benefit seems a lot richer. So I, I yeah, I'm I'm kind <laughs> yes. of glad to see. I mean, I've so you know, full disclosure. In a previous lifetime, I was a union representative for three different locals. Um, and, you know, have seen a various levels of EAP benefit and did not always feel like it was super utilized. And I just feel like the culture is sort of making a big shift around mental health and behavioral health utilization. So, yeah, okay, definitely. I'll go back on yeah. you. Thanks for taking that. I should mention, this is actually just utilization of people who were referred to a provider. Right? We're very conservative in what we count as utilization. Um, mm -hmm. Julia talked a little bit about kind of total impact mm -hmm. moment, but this is just those people who are referred to a provider. Yeah, and you and you are right um, that that whole mental health conversation is different now and, and in a good way. You know, I do like to see that stigma going down and I think more people are accessing, but also, you know, it's just in the daily conversation, you know, I'm seeing my counselor. And so that's been a good change. Employers are more aware of it um, and they're able to promote it more, so. All right. And and I was going to say, Umberto is right about that acuity. And the other thing we've seen that's increased dramatically uh, is um, CISD requests over the last um, few years. So more group kind of response as well. All right. Next slide. So if you look kind of at the total for the year, um, over a little over 13,000 members, um, individual members receive services. So 4,600 of those, just to give you a breakdown, received the individual services. So whether that's counseling or the, the uh, resources for life, um, 4,500 of those participated in group services. Many of those were critical incident debriefings, but that also includes webinars and, um, and uh, like orientations and things like that. And then 3,600 of those use digital resources. So um, the resources and tools on the member, member hub through 50 of that was the Whole Life Directions um, app. So go to the next slide. So just giving you a little bit, another way to look at some of that data, 60% of those cases, those individual cases were clinical, meaning counseling. Um, and 40% of them it says work, family, life, resources for life. That's kind of interchangeable. So that includes the legal and the financial and elder care, child care resources, things like that. The next slide. So this just gives you a snapshot over of counseling over the last four years. Um, the last column, 2023, is year to date. So it's about half the year. Um, but you can see marriage and relationship, which is usually how it is. Um, it's It's been number one the last three years. It's kind of traded places with anxiety, hit the top in 2020. I'm sure you can guess what that was about. You know, that's also COVID related in there. And we were measuring that at the time. Um, family has stayed at number three. It's kind of depression bumped up there a little bit in 2023. Grief is a new one in the top five. And then depression. Um, and so those are the top presenting issues for counseling. And then the next slide. So these are the, when we have work-life requests, legal, and that's been, I don't, I, if we put on 10 years, <laughs> I think on there, that's mm -hmm. kind of been number one. I will say though, the number one legal issue is domestic. So divorce and those types of things. So it's still the family issue is uh, number one, even on this side. And then you can see the others resource retrieval bumped up. Um, I think you're seeing that, as I mentioned, with our hub, the virtual care navigator. Um, I think that drove a lot of that. Um, housing is on there, too, as financial. And the will questionnaire is people who have a, a simple estate can, um, by answering that questionnaire, set up a will and it, get, it can get it notarized and all of that through the program. You know, and, and this is a way where we also really help serve kind of those social determinants of health and assess for those to help people with those. Um, both people accessing directly, but our counselors and our clinical staff on the phones routinely refer people to our resource retrieval team and working with things around housing and rent and financial assistance and things like that. So even if they're not calling directly for that, we may assess that that could be going on or impacting them in some way and help refer them to those services. 
All right, next slide. So thank you, thank you, Julie. I'll yeah. take it. I'll take the next one. So anonymous with our partner supportive. We introduced that last month. Uh, so just a reminder, it's real time uh, chat based anonymous uh, uh, conversations that people have 24 seven with people from organizations all over the country. So it's not necessarily PEB members and it's typically four or five people and there's a professional you know trained moderator that is keeping people on track and providing content uh, that's relevant to what that group's conversation is about so we can go to the next slide to show you some first month data it's early days right we're just just getting out there uh, and we are working with different agencies like uh, state hospital talking leadership and uh, going out and promoting uh, virtual peer support and with other agencies as well. So in the first month, uh, the top issues that people wanted to talk about were uh, social connection, depression or mood, work and anxiety. So that's that's what we're seeing. We can report, you know, later on. I'm, I'm meeting with some, you know, folks from PEB, and we'll talk, you know, every you know, so often about uh, how anonymous virtual peer support is going. But so far, so good. You know, we are expecting that it's going to be another good way for people to uh, get some get some support. So if we can go to the next slide. Do you want to remind you that we also provide uh, support for supervisors? So our clinicians are available to consult with managers who are maybe concerned about someone or want to talk about a situation at work that involves people. Uh, we're available 24 seven for uh, managers as well. We have web based resources, as Julie mentioned on our website. There's an organization support uh, site. We have uh, micro training videos that we just put up there. Uh, they're between two and three minutes around various topics that our clinicians have uh, consulted with managers uh, over the years, like emotional intelligence, self care, how to have a one on one, how to go from being a peer to a supervisor, all sorts of different things. And then for people that choose to, we also send out a quarterly uh, leadership uh, newsletter. We can go to the next slide. And then just kind of for the organization, as Julie mentioned, we have critical incident response. So once again, available 24 seven to consult with the manager HR about a traumatic event that has happened uh, you know, in the workplace and to start to work on providing either group and or individual uh, services for those employees who are affected. We also have webinars and we also do what we call performance based referrals. So that's a management uh, referral to our services. We can go to the next slide. And uh, regarding communication, I mentioned the newsletter for uh, leaders that comes out every quarter. Every month we do send out a Canopy Connections uh, newsletter that goes to everyone who's signed up on the website as well as people who have subscribed to our newsletter. And we highlight a different service uh, every month and we put out a flyer both in English and in Spanish so that people know about it and can promote it. And if you can go to the next slide. Every year we put out a, a calendar, so some groups uh, choose to kind of piggyback off of ours a little bit, but they know what's coming. So like in October, there's substance misuse in December is going to be stress management. Uh, next month is suicide awareness, so people can see what we're going to put out and um, make sure to let members know about our services. If we can go to the next slide. Just want to show you we're trying to be a little more colorful, a little more attention grabbing, a little less wordy. Uh, these are some posters that uh, different agencies have ordered to put up in break rooms and whatnot. Uh, and so we're continuing to move that way. Less black and white text, you know, should be, you know, have to be uh, heard or seen, right? So we can go to the next slide. And then just want to let you know, always working on, you know, what's next. Uh, so looking later this year and kind of beyond, we are planning to update our DCBT uh, and make some changes to that, make it um, even a better experience for our members. Uh, also, as Julie mentioned, uh, we're just about to launch online counselor search where people can put in different filters and find counselors and then also online uh, either self referral or scheduling with counselors. Uh, and then we're also working on a digital uh, coaching platform and um, 
we have started doing some blog posts for HR and we're looking at an HR um, portal to just provide resources for HR. So that's kind of looking ahead. And if we can go to the next slide, I know we're pretty much out of time, but I think there were a couple of people that wanted to ask a couple of quick questions. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, um, so I'm aware of a of a member who called Canopy on July 17th. Mm -hmm. And this person needed some behavioral health services. Um, and this person's requirement was to meet a counselor in person mm -hmm. because they need some privacy in their home situation. So, uh, so Canopy <laughs> took their information, gave them a referral. That took, you know, some days, but they eventually got it sorted out. And uh, so they went to this appointment and the counselor's main solution uh, and advice was to was to pray with this person. Now, maybe that's fine, but uh, th this member is an atheist, so that wasn't a good match. And I asked, like, did Canopy ask, like, what your religion and background is? And she said, no. Uh, so that that's interesting because it around the slides where we were talking about matching uh, to counselors, you would think that like religion, creed, etc., would be one of those criteria. So that's interesting. Okay, so then they gave them another uh, referral. You know, so mm -hmm. they agreed, like, okay, okay, it's not a good match. So that went on several days. No one, uh, this referral didn't contact them. So they called back Canopy and said, you know, I haven't heard back. And they, oh, gosh, that's really frustrating. We'll send another referral to this counselor to be sure that they saw it. More days go by. Counselor does not contact them. Uh, so then they contact Canopy again. Canopy's like, well, I don't know what happened, but we're just going to give up on that one. And then they gave them a third referral. Uh, <clears throat> that one didn't uh, didn't respond for uh, four or five days. They responded back to uh, they uh, uh, contacted Canopy again. Well, I haven't heard back. Wow, this is really frustrating. So like we'll we'll uh, send another referral to the same person again. Uh, to be sure, and at this point, uh, my this uh, uh, member has given up on the idea of an in-person, you know, mm. uh, their original requests, and it's just like whoever. Uh, so then, upon this, I don't know whatever this count is, sixth referral, um, the then the person gets back to them, and now they are scheduled for September fifth. So July seventeenth. September 5th is the, the scheduled date. So that's far beyond what your statistics mm -hmm. show. So just wanted to get your feedback. Uh, is that our like goal here of, of what we want to see on customer service? So yeah. no, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, no, obviously not. And, um, you know, I'd want to even be able to to look into that case to see. There are cases where there are challenges, right? That six and a half days is our average. So we do have cases that are much shorter than that that get matched up and ones that don't, um, that go longer like this case. And that would be included in that, that data because we count all those cases, right? Um, in terms of that first appointment date. So I would have to look in terms of what those challenges, that, that first challenge with the provider, with the religious, praying. Um, I'd want to even know more about because we wouldn't have us uh, unless somebody specifically asked for that. We don't assign them to counselors that that have that initial approach. So it sounds like that could be a quality issue with that provider that we would want to know about so we can investigate with that. Um, well, that's so usually member that, initiated. So that should not have happened. Go ahead. So my Sorry, response Sean. to that is like when so they just uh, this member, you know, Googled the person after. It's very clear on their website, the yeah. the 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 counselor, like, yeah, this is my approach and so on. Yeah. So that's just like a little basic, 
research on one's own network, right? Right. So I'm, I'm also in this situation where, so I was the one that suggested to this member, like, hey, uh, we have an EAP, consider using, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They're really great and their statistics look good. Uh, and so this, you know, how do I interpret this, right? So it's like, on the one hand, this is extremely bad luck that we happen to uh, like a swing and a miss, like a big miss. And it happens yeah. to be the time that a ped board member advises like an acquaintance. Yeah. Uh, like that's pretty remarkable, right? I mean, it's just like kind of exceptionally bad. Or this is more common than it seems, right? And so I, I kind of have to take it like this is more common, right? Because what are the odds? And so now I'm a little hesitant to refer people, right? Because yeah. this this was not a good experience. Um, and I'm also starting to wonder, like, well, what if the, you know, all these online resources we you just described about, like, finding your own counselor and whatever, mm -hmm. your own phone list was not accurate about who was taking uh, members, right? Because the second counselor didn't even respond at all uh so uh so how would our members fare if they didn't even have canopy bugging the people mm -hmm. right so i it just opens a lot of questions about quality control uh the initial intake of just like tell me about yourself like um uh th what kinds of things are important so we can make a good match and the expectation of the counselors to actually respond within a certain window and so on. What follow up is there if that doesn't happen? Was the second counselor ever approached about like, hey, we referred and nothing happened. W let's talk about that process, um, et cetera. So this just kind of like opens up a lot of questions about, um, you know, Canopy's <laughs> ability to be able to do what we're paying for. Yeah. No, absolutely, Sean, and those are legitimate questions that you're having, right? Um, and we take this quality assurance very, very seriously. We have a quality assurance um, committee that watches all of these cases. We do review these cases um, weekly to make sure that that's happening. Um, so I would assert that this is a bad luck one. There are, this is a challenge, you know, Finding providers who are available is a challenge. That's why we have a whole staff that does that, right? And the what happens when somebody calls in, um, what should happen is some of that process does go back and forth depending on the specialties they want and the geographic availability and that they want in person. That makes it more challenging. And so our staff works to match those counselors. Now we work with our counselors to let us know when they have availability. Um, sometimes they they don't, or they did yesterday and they don't today. And so there is a whole provider relations staff that works on that communication. Um, so sometimes at intake, when we're talking to that person, we don't know until we call them without referral and then have to re-refer them to another person. So there is a whole process that's that process I mentioned when we work hard to get that six and a half day stat because it does take a lot of a back and forth to try to find that person, that provider, um, because it is almost impossible sometimes in today's for people to find a provider just by going through a list. And so we have to do that. So providers had availability yesterday, don't today. And so it is a difficult process. I understand now your doubt of what that process is. Um, you know, I what I would really like in offline is if you're able to let me know who that person is so we could look into that case and find out what happened with that case, because that is very helpful and instructive to us to be able to look at what those different um, roadblocks were that happened, um, because that one didn't happen in the way that it should have happened and in the way that it more commonly happens with us to be able to get that six and a half day stat. Absolutely. Um, so, Julie, th thank you for responding to Sean. And um, yeah. yes, I, I do encourage taking this offline. Um, and I know we have, you know, we have issues with um, providers that our PEB staff are often incredibly helpful in terms of working with our carriers to help resolve. Um, mm -hmm. And they, and these, mm -hmm. these issues come up. And I know we're going to be talking about more about the challenges with mental health and provider access and networks. And we're going to be 
moving on uh, to that next. So I'm going to go ahead and move us. I appreciate both right. of you, Umberto and Julie, thank speaking you. to us. So thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I've got Andrew Hoffheimer and Dan Went from Mercer. And um, after this presentation, we are going to be taking a break. So I want to let you all know that too. We're about 15 minutes behind schedule at this point. All right, Andrew, thank you, go ahead. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Siobhan. Um, we will we will do our best to stick to this 30 minutes here since we're running just a few behind. Um, I think this will this will be a good continuation from the discussion that um, Canopy just led us on around provider panels. Um, this obviously is is more focused on the medical plans, but nonetheless, some of the some of the same issues I think will will surface. Um, and so for the next 30 minutes, Mercer will provide this primer on network adequacy specific to behavioral health amongst your medical plans. Um, obviously, this is a, a topic that we've talked about um, quite a bit over the last few years, continues to be relevant um, both locally as well as nationally. Um, and you know, ultimately, this is important because we're trying to ensure that there's uh, adequate in-network provider access for PEP members. Uh, obviously, a lot of challenges when it comes to network adequacy uh, as it relates to behavioral health. Um, so we'll talk through those as well. Shortage of providers, uh, low or a perception of low reimbursement rates, um, and um, some reluctance for some providers who aren't part of a part of a larger org to participate in in these insurance panels um, due to the the administrative burden. Um, and so today with me, I have my colleague Dan Went. Dan is a behavioral health consultant at Mercer. Uh, he is also a trained social worker. Um, he has a lot of experience in this area um, when it comes to evaluating and monitoring behavioral health network adequacy, as well as helping to develop um, roadmaps to improve network adequacy. Um, before I hand it over to Dan, I'll just make a couple of comments on the format um, for this uh, next hour or so. Um, and so, as I said, Mercer will give this 30 minute primer. We'll hand it over to the medical carers who will each have 20 minutes to um, provide a presentation. Um, we had asked the medical carers to respond to some questions, um, and you will see those written responses in the back of your packets, board members. Um, and we've asked them to, during their 20 minute presentations, um, highlight their responses that they think are most relevant, focusing on not only successes, but also some challenges and how they're working through those. And so with that said, uh, Dan, I will hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Andrew. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, as Andrew introduced me, my name is Dan Wendt. I'm a principal consultant with Mercer. I've been with the firm here for about 12 years. Um, most of the data that we're gonna review in the primer is, is oriented towards uh, Medicaid network adequacy standards and reporting. We do have some examples uh, also of Medicare Advantage. Um, I'll try to be uh, discussing some of the Oregon specific network adequ adequacy requirements that apply to the PEBS contracted carriers as well. Um, the primary intent behind quantitative network standards is really to promote timely access to behavioral health services. However, I, I will say that the evidence base to support improved access to care um, is limited just, just based on establishing network standards. Um, I think there need, there definitely needs to be some additional research to really understand how the network standards would access uh, would enhance access to care and um, improve utilization of services. Um, and it's important to identify the standards that are most effective that are based on the characteristics of a particular geographic service area, like a, a rural county or a place where there may be shortages of, of healthcare professionals. Um, there's other barriers in the specific to the behavioral health field that that limit the ability to study the impact of network adequacy standards. Um, some of those include um, a lack of consensus in defining and interpreting standards across geographic regions, uh, the impact of workforce shortages on meeting the standards. Um, sometimes there's a lack of specialty providers that can render time and distance standards challenging or in, impossible to meet. Um, Andrew mentioned the perception of low reimbursement rates that limit providers' interest and in, in perhaps joining networks. 
And then there's always issues with uh, inaccurate, out of date, and, and non user friendly provider directories. So once um, network adequacy, adequacy standards are established, the administrative oversight entity, in this case PEB, uh, must conduct oversight and monitoring, which can be resource intensive. It also requires personnel with the, the appropriate knowledge, skills, and abilities to effectively assess the ongoing sufficiency of the carrier's behavioral health network. Um, I will call out, uh, again, I will call out the um, Oregon Administrative Rule uh, requirements when applicable here. Um, specifically, I believe that's 410, 141, 3515, and uh, the section of the rule is network adequacy. So um, for uh, the next slide, the, the agenda for this presentation. I'm not sure who's controlling the slides. This is Rose. I'm controlling the slides. OK. Do you want so uh, we're going to look at a roadmap to improving network adequacy. We're going to review some common behavioral health network standards, um, some approaches to monitoring behavioral health network adequacy, including the activities as well as data collection and reporting. Um, some common issues in today's world related to contracting with behavioral health providers, um, and then um, just uh, improving the, the, the adequacy of the behavioral health network. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, roadmap uh, relates to improving access to behavioral health services. Uh, actually, Mercer initially presented this to the IWG back in October of, of 2021. Um, we are uh, today going to focus um, on some of these, but not all. Um, I won't read through because of our time constraints here. I won't read through all nine of the of the of the recommendations here. Um, but we will be focusing on items one, two, and five. Um, so minimum standards related to behavioral health network adequacy, network adequacy reporting, and um, information related to barriers to, to contracting with behavioral health providers. Next slide, Rose, please. So some um, common areas uh, for what we refer to sometimes as quantitative network standards uh, that can be used by administrative oversight entities and their contracted health plans. Um, quantitative standards apply specific metrics or benchmarks to define and monitor access and availability of care. Um, I think the most common example is probably the, the geographic distance standards, time and distance standards. Um, but we also are going to cover uh, minimum provider to enrollee ratios, minimum percentage of contracted providers that are accepting new members, maximum wait times for an appointment, which are also referred to as appointment availability standards, and then behavioral health provider operating hours is related to accessibility uh, on evenings or perhaps weekends. Uh, next slide, please. So the first quantitative network standard I want to review with the group here are provider to enrollee ratios. And as you can see here, um, we've got some examples of uh, what we see in, in other state contracts um, for particular practitioner types, psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, licensed clinical social workers, and marriage and family therapists. Uh, so these are ratios to uh, covered lives or enrollees. Um, and then we have our, our Medicare Advantage uh, example standards as well on the right column. And um, under the Medicare Advantage network adequacy, it's, a, it's assessed at the county level. And they, they um, classify their, uh, their counties into five county type designations. And those include large metro, uh, metro, micro, rural, and counties with extreme access considerations. And uh, CMS, who, who oversees the, the Medicare Advantage uh, program, uses a county-type designation method 
that's based on population size and density parameters of individual counties. So it's it's a pretty sophisticated approach. Now I did note in the um, uh, Oregon Ad administrative rule, um, the MCEs, um, the managed care entities, uh, are required to collect and, and actively monitor data on provider to enrollee ratios, but the ratios are, are not specified in terms of applicable provider type, geographic service area, or how the ratio should be calculated. Um, next slide, please. Time and distance standards. Um, Again, this is one of the most common quantitative standards that's currently in use. Uh, time and distance standards are typically evaluated through software uh, that plots available providers uh, against the carrier's enrollees' physical location in a particular geographic area. Um, this is also referred to as geospatial mapping, and they're used to produce evidence that the carrier has sufficient providers to meet the established time and distance standards. Um, this can be misleading as some providers may no longer be active in the carrier's network. Um, this gets back to the issue of updating provider network directories on an ongoing basis, or the provider may not be accepting new members due to capacity limitations. So um, there may be providers in the area, but they, they can't um, accommodate uh, members at a particular point in time. Um, when we looked at the Oregon administrative rule language, um, we did note that there are time and distance standards, and those are uh, for urban areas, 30 minutes or 30 miles, and for rural areas that uh, converts to 60 minutes or 60 miles. Next slide, please. Um, this next one relates to um, providers that are accepting new referrals. Um, the percentage of providers accepting new clients is a, a quantitative metric that's used to measure network adequacy and provider availability. Um, accrediting bodies require organizations to either report the ratio of each type of behavioral health care practitioner to the number of members, or the ratio of each type of behavioral health care practitioner that's accepting new patients to the number of members. Um, the application of this standard is a little less common. Medicare Advantage and many Medicaid programs um, denote which providers are not accepting new patients in their provider directories, which again require frequent updates, at least monthly is the recommendation. Um, as with provider to enrollee ratios, a state can uh, elect to restrict the standard to high volume providers when considering this measure. Um, again, this requires the administrative oversight entity to define the types of high volume behavioral health providers, um, establish the measurable standards for each type of practitioner, as well as uh, standards for the geographic distribution. And then um, it's recommended that this performance be analyzed at least annually. Um, examples of, of high volume um, providers include um, practitioners such as psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, clinical social workers, marriage and family therapists, substance use counselors, addiction medicine specialists, and um, psychiatric clinical nurse specialists. As you can see, we've, we've got some um, examples on the slide there in the, in the um, table. I won't go through all these because of our time, uh, but these come from um, contracts uh, in other states as well as the uh, CMS Medicare Advantage program. Uh, in the Oregon administrative rule, there is a stipulation that MCE shall collect and actively monitor data on the percentage of contracted providers accepting new members. A slide six. Next slide, please. So this is around maximum wait times for an appointment. Um, this is also referred to as appointment availability standards. Um, on the slide, you can see uh, we, we have um, a few points here to cover. Uh, Medicare Advantage and, and many of the Medicaid programs that we work with um, are required to, to identify providers that are not accepting new patients in their directories. Um, 
some policies uh, in some states require at least 70% of the providers accept new patients. And um, some states set a minimum percentage of providers. Perhaps folks could go on mute to get some background um, noise here. And some states uh, can limit the number or the percentage of providers that are not accepting new patients at a given point in time. So getting back to the maximum wait times, I'm sorry, I was, I was on the wrong slide. I was referencing uh, the maximum wait times for an appointment um, are depicted in this table here. And we have different types of services, um, routine, emergency, uh, mobile crisis even is represented here. And we have some different states with different um, appointment availability standards. These are pretty common uh, in terms of emergency, urgent and routine responses, uh, which can range from 24, 72 hours and, and seven days respectively. Um, for, um, for the uh, Oregon Administrative Rule, there is a requirement that the MCA, MCEs collect and actively monitor data on wait times to appointment. Um, including specific data for behavioral health wait times, um, but the specific time frames are, are not specified there. We also have accrediting bodies that have recommendations around um, uh, the different time frames for for appointments. Um, for uh, instance, um, urgent care within 48 hours. Um, initial visit for routine care within 10 business days or follow up for routine care within a time frame defined by the organization. So that's kind of um, left open. Next slide, please. Um, this this quantitative network standard refers to um, provider operating hours. Uh, again, this promotes um, easier access to care when when appointments are available during non to non-traditional work hours or even weekends. Um, network standards for operating hours uh, specify when a member um, should have access to behavioral health services apart from the emergent and urgent services. Uh, we found in our research that few states require standards that include expanded hours of operation or uh, even uh, weekends or evenings. Um, some states do. Um, most of, of these um, operating hour standards indicate the services must either be comparable to commercial plans uh, like medical assistance fee for service standards, um, or they say something like consistent with normal business hours, or even meeting the needs of the eligible population. So again, very broad, a little bit difficult to, to measure and monitor in terms of uh, oversight. Um, in Michigan, uh, they require providers to be in operation eight hours per day, Monday through Friday, save for holidays. Um, Arizona has more broad frames in its standards. Uh, they, they make a statement about reasonable access, um, but then they do specify services that should be accessible during normal business hours or sooner if medically necessary. A couple of the states have additional standards on operating hours to enhance access. Uh, for example, California requires that a provider should have extended hours at least one day a week or for four hours on Saturday. And Missouri requires the network to have licensed telehealth therapists available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In terms of the Oregon administrative rule language, um, there's a statement that MCEs shall collect and actively monitor data on hours of operation. So again, it's 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 left broad like some of the examples that I just reviewed. Next slide, please. So monitoring behavioral health network adequacy or network management activities. Um, and, and just kind of looking at um, the content here. Um, we, we just have a few examples of, of some monitoring activities that are typically utilized. Um, it can be uh, tracking and trending complaints related to access to care. Um, there's a, a process around secret shopper surveys or proxy calls where you 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 phone 
a provider and ask when the next available appointment might be available be be available. Um, CMS is is kind of emphasizing this in some draft rules that they just published in May, uh, where they're going to require states to conduct these types of secret uh, shopper surveys or um, a delegate of the state. Um, monitoring service utilization trends can identify over and under utilization of certain services. Um, monitoring the availability of behavioral health services in alternative settings. Um, specific performance measures that uh, monitor access to care. And then member experience surveys that that specifically ask about the timeliness of services. And the availability of, of care. Um, most managed care plans have developed uh, like a multi pronged approach for monitoring access and network adequacy. Um, this can include policies and procedures, tools and other activities. Uh, more recently, most managed care plans monitor behavioral health service utilization across racial and ethnic populations. Um, managed care plans, um, their network monitoring activities can include a review of monthly or quarterly capacity or access reports. Uh, as I mentioned, a review of member complaints and administrative complaints. Uh, a review of audit network authorizations. Meetings with their provider advisory councils can provide insight or they can um, use RFIs or RFPs uh, to recoup providers when gaps or a targeted need is identified. Um, it's also helpful to to review quality of care concerns that may um, you know, illustrate access to care or timeliness of care issues. And then uh, the member and provider satisfaction surveys are another source. So network management functions are, are supported by data and reports that can include um, the geo accessibility mapping that can be done quarterly or annually, um, provider ratio reports, annual accessibility of services reports, annual penetration reports, non participating provider reports, um, all can inform this process. Um, during COVID, um, some some of the um, carriers uh, in, in other states um, may have instituted some financial assistance to develop and retain the workforce. Um, you know, rate increases for ambulatory providers or one time payments to providers. Um, sustainment plans or alternative payment arrangements that allow providers to be paid um, on the pre pandemic uh, financials. Um, those were all strategies that were used um, during the, the height of the COVID pandemic. In terms of um, the Oregon administrative rule in this context, there are there are a couple things um, that are, are identified, and I, I'm curious if if the board has had an opportunity to review these. But it says that the MCE shall have access have an access plan that establishes a protocol for monitoring and ensuring access. Uh, outlines how provider capacity is determined, establishes procedures for monthly monitoring of capacity and access, and for improving access and managing access in times of reduced per participating provider capacity. And in addition, um, the MCEs must submit a delivery system network uh, or DSN report annually to the authority that includes access data other access related analysis in the form and manner required by the authority, including but not limited to capacity reports on behavioral health access, interpreter utilization by the MCE's provider network and provider and behavioral health provider network. So very relevant um, reporting that's required uh, that's um, directly tied to this topic we're, we're discussing today. Uh, next slide, please. So contracting with behavioral health providers, big challenge right now. Um, if we if we look at um, some of the uh, challenges that are identified here on this slide, um, there's definitely a shortage of practitioners and behavioral health service providers, particularly in clinical or in uh, rural areas. Um, there are particular types of providers that are, are difficult to find. 
um, the perceived low reimbursement rates. Um, some some providers don't want to participate in a network due to administrative burden or perceived delays in claims payments. Um, you know, we've we've have documented shortages nationally of psychiatrists and 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 uh, social workers and and other types of practitioners. Um, you know, some strategies are to to, to try to enhance reimbursement rates um, or provide tuition reimbursement, internships, clinical placements, and scholarship initiatives have been tried. Um, so this this is a this is a big area um, it, it, with no no real easy solutions. Um, the uh, you know there's there's nothing specific to workforce development initiatives that I was able to find in the Oregon administrative rule, but um, that that is one um, thing that some states have adopted. It's requiring the managed care plans or the carriers to develop a workforce um, recruitment and retention plan and then uh, accompany activities that are updated um, in terms of those efforts. So at, at this point, we have just a, a little less than five minutes left, I believe. Um, I guess I'll, I'll open it up to any comments or, or questions. I don't, I don't see anything from board members. Go ahead. OK, thank you. Andrew, I'll turn it back over to you to cl close us out here. Sure. Thanks, Danny. I really appreciate that overview. Um, and so I, I think before, Siobhan, before we get into the uh, medical presentations, I think um, we had a break schedule, so I don't know if, um, how, how long you want that to go on for. Yes, we'll take a um, 10 minute break. So I'm going to make a note. We'll reconvene at 1121. All right. Thank you, everyone.
All right, welcome back from break, everyone. It's 1121. So I want to make sure we have Dr. Paul Geiger and Dustin Howard and Stephanie Dreyfus with us. Hi, it's Paul Geiger. I'm here. Hello. So um, we're going to start our presentations from our carriers and we're starting with Providence. So I will hand it over to you, Dr. Geiger. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, happy to be here. I'm Paul Geiger, uh, Medical Director for Behavioral Health for Providence Health Plan. And our team has uh, kind of divvied up uh, uh, the presentation uh, uh, between a couple of folks. I'm going to be talking about um, uh, behavioral health uh, integration, uh, how we think about that and uh, emphasize that. Um, so I, I have one. I'm just presenting on that one slide. So if we could maybe start there. <coughs> Um, so a couple of things about uh, behavioral health uh, and physical health uh, integration is, you know, we at Providence Health Plan really do value this uh, a as a concept and we support it. Um, uh, I'd start by, by reminding folks, this is probably not news to the, bo the board, but um, we did make a, a, a significant decision a few years ago to insource the behavioral health service line uh, we had for many years uh, outsourced this to a third party, uh, and we saw the value of integrating that service line uh, under one roof. So we did uh, bring that in-house, uh, so that's now just under one roof. Uh, that's been the case since uh, for, for PEP since 2021. Um, we've got a, a model where we partnered with Carillon, who provides some uh, expertise in uh, uh, utilization management and case management, uh, but uh, we're the client and we oversee that uh, relationship 100%. We hold the risk, uh, we write the policies, uh, and so that's all under our, our control. Um, and, you know, having this in-house has been really helpful. You know, every aspect of the plan now uh, uh, touches behavioral health and that allows us to uh, coordinate and be consistent among a variety of different aspects of the plan, whether it's care management, pharmacy, medical policy, uh, you know, claims, customer service, et cetera. So um, just, just a way to start by saying, you know, we really value this. Um, we, we support the integrated uh, model in primary care. So, you know, uh, 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 integration services are something that, that we cover and encourage. And based on a relationship with Providence Medical Group, which is, you know, I think something near maybe half of our members have a, a PMG primary care provider. That is a system that is highly integrated. And in, in Oregon, in Southwest Washington, uh, every clinic has an embedded psychologist, uh, and that's by design. And and we really and we support that. We cover the codes, and we have a very close relationship with that uh, with that system. My prior role was as the regional director of the Oregon uh, region. Uh, and so I sat on the team that, that oversaw uh, that, uh, that uh, psychologist team. So um, we support that, <clears throat> we encourage it, and we know that because of the relationship we have with PMG, um, many of our members are just kind of automatically in a system where mental health integration in their care team uh, is incorporated. And then at the plan level, I uh, just wanted to highlight, you know, one area that I think that um, we can really show uh, that we believe and value this integration model is in, in care management. And so, you know, we've got an integrated team uh, reporting under one care management division. And so, um, you know, we got the medical care managers and the behavioral health care managers. It's all the same uh, group of folks. Um, we have developed communication systems uh, that contain all physical health and behavioral health information. So if a, if a medical care manager is looking at a case, they're aware of the BH, uh, uh, stuff. If a mental health care manager is working with a member, they can see the physical information. So that's all integrated. Um, we trained all of our care management staff in mental health first aid, whether you're a, a behavioral health uh, care manager or a medical care manager, everybody got trained in that. So uh, we really are emphasizing the importance of uh, behavioral health to our entire staff. And we've developed uh, a, a clear cut uh, uh, pathways for the, the medical care management team to uh, interact with the behavioral health uh, management team. And so we've developed basically kind of workflows for uh, each of those kind of uh, types of care manager to uh, consult 
uh, with each other, uh, co-manage with each other, or even uh, perhaps transfer a case. And uh, we just actually had a case last week where we had a very complicated case being managed by a behavioral health person. The member had a lot of medical uh, comorbidities. And so we you know, pushed a button. We got a, a, a basically a co-management system in place for them. So um, probably this care management uh, design uh, and implementation is, is, is perhaps, I think, one of the uh, most obvious ways that we can demonstrate that we believe uh, that the integration of mental, mental and physical health is important. Um, so I'm just presenting on this one little area. The rest of the team is going to take the other questions. Uh, I will hand it off. All right. Thank you, Dr. Geiger. And this is uh, Dustin Howard. I'm the Director of uh, Behavioral Health Services and oversee our uh, behavioral health clinical programs alongside uh, Mel Top, who's the Director of uh, Medical Care Management. So I'll be taking the, uh, the next couple of slides. So maybe we can go to the next one. The next one after that. All right, so the um, one topic that I'll be discussing is um, how we're addressing social determinants of health. And um, this is something that's fully embedded in all of the work that we're doing with uh, members, both in behavioral health case management, but also in all of the medical care management that's occurring. Um, I wanted to highlight that we have a, a health equity and social determinant of health task force that's currently being led by our chief uh, equity officer which is Tim Shell Tarbett. Um, and that group is what is uh, kind of directing some of the uh, collection of data, analysis of data, and also informing the organization on um, some solutions or opportunities to uh, help meet the needs of members where a social determinant of health or an equity issue has been identified. Um, one of our primary levers right now to evaluate for social determinant of health needs is uh, through care management. And I'm defining care management a little bit broadly to include uh, behavioral health uh, case management where someone might be identified because of a admission or a higher acuity trigger. Um, but we also do quite a bit of uh, screening of members um, who do not have high acuity triggers um, and that we do quite a bit of care navigation uh, with members who might be calling in and asking about um, connection with care. So in this full spectrum of member uh, facing intervention, all of the assessments are designed to screen for uh, the core foundation uh, or the foundational social determinant of health. Um, uh, particularly uh, food, transportation and shelter is where the primary focus has been. And when these uh, uh, things are identified for a particular member, um, that is incorporated into their overall care plan uh, and used to help coordinate a member into appropriate uh, services, either something that's internally offered through Providence Health Plan, such as our food disparity program, um, or to external uh, community resources to help uh, bridge the gap where we may have identified those. Um, some other ways that uh, Providence Health Plan is uh, identifying social determinant of health needs uh, is through uh, direct member report through the enrollment forms where these uh, things are being requested and asked about directly from members. Um, there's uh, the self-reported data through the care management assessments, which I just discussed. Um, and this information is also being pulled from uh, claims data eligibility files, electronic medical records, and CMS data. Um, so all of these uh, different areas are being uh, aggregated and analyzed uh, by our data an analytics team to help trend some of that information, uh, which is what's informing interventions um, that the team could recommend uh, that the organization begin investing in. And so there's also some geocoding of publicly available data um, to try and um, give some good faith estimate into what needs may be present in certain communities um, that are within the footprint of Providence Health Plan, um, which also informs some of the uh, interventions that are being considered. Next slide. OK, so this pivots to wait list for covered behavioral health services, which um, is uh, kind of a difficult uh, question to answer, but I'd like to answer this from the health plans standpoint here. Um, so we as the health plan do not maintain any wait list for services. However, we're aware that there are at times providers that do uh, have wait lists. Um, 
and this could be uh, facilities, specialty services, or even outpatient services. Um, where we're typically seeing this um, right now is around some of the specialty uh, clinical interventions uh, at any level of care, uh, particularly for eating disorder. Um, ABA can also uh, have this particular issue. Um, and so the way that we're trying to manage this on our side to make sure that we're helping to steer people to uh, the right uh, levels of care, right facilities, right providers that have availability is one, our care navigation team does uh, maintain a live list of providers um, that we have called uh, for a particular member inquiring about their availability. And once we've done that, we log those those providers or facilities on this list. And so we maintain that live um, uh, kind of running log of who's currently accepting or when their next available appointment generally is. And so we consult those lists when we're trying to provide members with referrals uh, for whatever their needs might be. And that's proven to be pretty successful. Um, we were able to stay um, pretty well on pulse with facilities that have wait lists. Uh, which we're not seeing as often, except for some eating disorder um, programs. Uh, but for the ABA providers, that's where we've uh, kind of seen it more often. And so that's where we've kind of focused some of our, our wait list logging. Uh, some other ways that we've helped to mitigate this is by looking at virtual options, both for IOP and IOP equivalents um, for um, mental health and other specialty uh, clinical populations uh, like eating disorder, uh, looking into OCD, which we know can be a difficult um, population to get into care promptly. And so um, those are ways that we're also trying to help to mitigate some of that. the wait list challenge to make sure that folks have access to care uh, quickly and are not kind of waiting and languishing while they uh, <clears throat> try to get the care that they need. And that is I think it for for me, and I'm going to pass this on to Stephanie. All right, thank you. I just need the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our network and our network standards um, and appreciated uh, Mercer's presentation because um, ours is very consistent with some of the things they brought up. So the three ways we really formally, I would say, measure our network is um, by member ratios. Um, and we use a, a company, we kind of use community standards combined with a organization named Solucent to come up with those ratios. <clears throat> Excuse me, for time and distance, uh, we do use the CMS um, standards and Oregon for commercial um, uses the CMS standards. So that is consistent, whether it's Medicare or Oregon. Um, and then for appointment availability, we do have recommended appointment availability standards um, within the health plan. So in terms of how we are doing meeting those standards, um, before I kind of go into how we're doing, I want to be really clear, and I'll probably reiterate this a few times, that regardless of how we're doing um, on those standards, even if we're meeting, we know that that does not tell the full story of kind of what members are looking for, what um, kind of access we all want members to have um, to behavioral health services. So our network is always open everywhere to all provider types. We're always actively recruiting. Um, and of course, we always have an extra emphasis on providers who can provide um, diversity into our network or fill a unique need or a network gap. So I don't want to leave anybody the impression that whether we're meeting or not, that that, um, that, that means we're not actively recruiting to try to always increase. The other thing I want to um, specify, which is included here too, is when we measure how we're doing across our standards, we do not include telehealth only. So are other folks struggling to hear Stephanie? I believe she's frozen, but I want to double check that that's not me. Yeah, correct. Oh, am I frozen? Correct. Okay, now Look, you're 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 coming back. Am I back? I don't and, know what um, happened. Am I back now? Um, uh, yeah, you're a little bit choppy, but it's better. So okay. go ahead. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? If it's okay, I'm going to take myself off video. Maybe that will help. Okay, is that better? 
Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so I'll just keep going. I don't know where I left off, but um, anyway, um, we do not we do not count telehealth providers, um, you know, at, to meet our network standards. Although we have them, and we recognize that they are very important in our network. Um, so, in terms of how we meet on time and distance, we do meet everywhere on the facility side, except for those um, counties where there simply is no inpatient um, hospital facility available. And on the professional side, we generally meet, except we have some rural counties, like in this case, Malher and Harney, where we do not meet on the psychologist front because there simply are not enough available. Um, we do meet on the ratios, the member to provider ratio. And then on appointment availability, we do measure this once a year with an outside vendor. I will tell you that the response rate is always low. This um, in 2020, when they did it for 2023, it was particularly low. Um, and the places, probably like everybody, we are most challenged is um, with appointment availability. It's really psychiatry and non life threatening emergency. But again, we always have um, the telehealth option. We know not all members want to use. Um, a virtual option, I would say since the pandemic, we have a number of providers who have decided telehealth only is a better model. Um, so it has affected the availability of in-person appointments. And um, again, we do have telehealth options and are always looking at expanding. Thank you. So the ways we are looking to improve performance is, as I said, we're always actively recruiting. Um, we do monitor our network adequacy reports on a regular basis. Um, we also review on a regular basis our out-of-network reports, both to monitor what services are delivered out of network, but also to target providers um, who are seeing a higher volume of out-of-network members so that we can target recruitment. Um, we work really closely with the behavioral health navigation team to identify um, gaps um, and, and review member and provider complaints that come from a number of different areas within the company. On a monthly basis, um, we do meet with a cross-functional team, um, which you can see here, to really talk about any complaints, any gaps, anything they're hearing because uh, they are often talking or they are talking to members and providers kind of on a real-time basis. So are really helpful in identifying any specific or emerging um, needs. Um, and then one of our um, things that we really think supports our network is that our behavioral health network contracting our one team, which means they provide time to all the way through. So I'm uh, and also to. I'm going to interrupt again just because I think it's become pretty choppy. I don't know if you have someone else on your team who wants to finish the summarizing. Uh, sorry, I don't know why that's happening. Um, Ava or Darcy, can you step in? All right. Well, I don't hear anyone stepping in. I know. Um, I just want to make sure we we move is to the this, slides, but, the, but we can also hear yeah. you. Yeah. Is is this? Oh, I'm sorry. This better? is Dar This is Darcy White. I can. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so if you can take yeah. over, that Hi. would be great. You bet. Sure. I am Darcy White, the director of um, provider relations for the health plan. Um, just where Stephanie left off. We also have offer an integrated behavioral health team. So rather than having separate teams doing the contracting and doing the provider relations, a lot of the team members um, have that role integrated. So it really allows for stronger relationships and really understanding the full spectrum of what providers bring to us. So they work with them all year on claims issues or any issues they may have with the health plan, et cetera. And that helps us as we look at the contracting renegotiations or negotiations to just make sure that we have a strong onboarded provider community. We could move to the next slide. Um, and as we, you know, as we continue to attempt to recruit, what the problems that we're seeing are that they're just some providers are simply not contracting with any insurance companies or severely limiting their payers. Um, 
uh, having a particular difficulty with psychologists specializing in uh, testing at this time as well. And from a geography perspective, Deschutes and Lane are our most challenging. Um, again, as I mentioned, the way that we have integrated the roles uh, on the behavioral health team, I think is, is helpful for providers. Um, a lot of what we hear from providers is, how can you lower my administrative burden when I work with you? And so this is kind of one of the ways where we can really handhold and walk them through working with Providence Health Plan and make it a more positive experience. Um, we have one member of our team that is completely dedicated just to onboarding new mem new providers, um, which is really helpful to figure out how, you know, where do we go for this? How do we find that? Um, and then we also have a specialized behavioral health customer service team. And then I think to our last slide, um, uh, some of the other barriers are just a basic, a general lack of behavioral health providers in Oregon, which I know everyone experiences. And because, as Stephanie mentioned, we don't include telehealth only providers in our numbers, our um, members definitely have access to a large array of telehealth only providers. So um, that that's always helpful. There's an increased demand for services, um, and then the limiting of the of the um, payer contracts, et cetera. Uh, and then we're we're trying to balance affordability for both our members and for our for our business. We want to make sure that um, you know when you when you have a higher reimbursement rate, that also costs the member a lot for their co-share copay. So we want to really work with that, but we also want to get those behavioral health providers paid appropriately. So that's kind of a constant balancing act, but hopefully that wrapped it up for um, us. Are there any questions? for us on the network. Don, go ahead. Don, are you trying to get off mute? You're still, um, we can't hear you yet. How about now? Yes. Better? Okay. Okay, star six. We're making friends again. Um, thank you for your presentation and for your work to establish, stabilize, and reinforce an adequate provider network in behavioral health. It is clear that there are a whole lot of challenges around uh around this particularly with behavioral health also um with different kinds of access with across different geography uh and particularly for culturally appropriate services for example um and it seems to me that the network adequacy frameworks that we all have been using are haven't yet caught up with the massive shift that has occurred toward telehealth delivery which is to say measuring network adequacy without taking into consideration telehealth services simply doesn't reflect the service availability that you are providing to our members and to your members. Um, and so I, this is, this is not specific to you and it's not specific to behavioral health, it's across the board with the, with the transition that has occurred around the pandemic and the, and the lurch forward that healthcare delivery has taken into the telehealth space. And so I am interested in uh, consideration and assessment of the telehealth uh, services in a complementary way to the in-person services, particularly behavioral health, as so many behavioral health providers have decided not to offer in-person services at all at this time and, and are only offering um, and are only offering telehealth. So that is that is a, a sort of a, a future ask um, in terms of assessment and an understanding of how those telehealth providers and service availability uh, complement the the existing in-person and face-to-face um, -face opportunities. It may even be a predominance at this point, right? Telehealth access versus in-person for the reason that I mentioned before and others. So I look forward to understanding how network adequacy frameworks are evolving to take that telehealth service into account over the course of the coming weeks, months, years. 
And Don, is that a question for Providence in particular? And Stephanie, I think you need to go on mute. Um, I, I see your uh, your icon flashing. Um, and is that a, so? I just want to be clear if that's a question for Providence um, in particular, or overall as uh, Mercer is helping us assess adequacy for all of the carriers. It can be for both. Those will be both two different perspectives. I also don't know what our timing looks like in terms of trying to get to everything today. Uh, and it isn't a question that is of urgency. I do think it is a question that will help the carriers to more adequately represent the services that are being provided. Yeah, so I so um, to your point on time, we are we we know we're going to have to cut one of our presentations and we are squeezing our time. Uh, we and so maybe what we can do is we can discuss um, this for a future meeting. Sure. OK, thanks, Don. So um, thank you, Providence team. Um, let's go ahead and move to the Moda team. And we've got Erica Hedberg, Dan Toma, uh, Melissa Strong, and Dr. Yil Popovich for Moda. Great. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'll kick us off here really quick and get us moving so we can maybe try and catch up with some time. Um, my name is Erica Hedberg and I'm the Director of Government Programs for Moda Health. And today um, with me, uh, we have Dan Toma, who's our Director of Behavioral Health, Melissa Strong, who is our Manager of Provider Strategy, and then Dr. Popovich, who is our Vice President and Chief Medical Officer. So I'm going to pass this over to Melissa to get us started. Hi, thank you. So to get started, we did just want to level set, which I think we've all kind of talked about a bit at this point, which is how do we evaluate network access for behavioral health providers? So we do follow those requirements that are outlined by CMS. So I think everyone's pretty familiar with this because um, we've seen it a few times now. Um, and we do evaluate based off of, you, you know, using a geo access type analysis where we compare the providers available against the membership and not just pet membership, but also, you know, the entirety of membership, because I think it's a more realistic viewpoint because we know that the providers in the community are seeing, you know, members that are not just with a specific plan or a specific group. They're seeing an array of members So we want to be very representative of actual access. So we do um, look at a larger population for that when we're measuring it. And this is something that we do on at least a quarterly basis to make sure that we are keeping up with the changes that may happen within a network over time. Um, part of that analysis is also seeing if we have gaps in access. And if we do, making sure that we are coming up with corrective action plans and identifying providers that may be available to fill those gaps and recruiting them and offering them contract um, offers and network participation. So where access stands for Moda Health today with behavioral health is you can kind of see it at the bottom for outpatient clinical providers. So that would be, you know, your psychologist, um, social workers, therapists, um, those types of physicians, uh, the average percent of members with access using those standards, we are at 98.3 and our goal threshold is typically about 90%. So we look really good right there. And then for psychiatry providers, we are at 99.9% .9 access. And if we can go to the next slide, um, we can kind of just reflect on the current state of behavioral health providers. So I think, you know, we're aware that there is a high demand for these types of provider services. Um, so that is something that can be a little bit, you know, of a challenge when we're talking about recruiting providers. Um, there's also difficult access. We know that, you know, even though we may have a broad network of providers, for example, Moda Health, we have about 6,700 statewide in Oregon, Appointments can be a little bit challenging, you know, providers that are accepting new patients or appointment availability. It may, you know, be a few weeks to get an appointment and that can be a challenge. And we are also experiencing not just statewide shortages, but national shortages. So when we're talking about uh, providers that may be available via telehealth, it's not, you know, just providers in Oregon that's impacting that. It's nationally. 
And then lastly, this topic of quality and outcomes. Um, so there's variable quality available and little transparency or accountability. Um, and that is a topic that Dan Tomo will get into a little bit more. So I'm gonna leave that for him. And then next slide, please. And these are just our efforts to recruit more behavioral health providers. So we are contracted with uh, behavioral health telehealth provider groups that are offering faster access um, than those that may be at a physical location. So just a little bit more availability there. And this is another topic Dan will get into a little bit further. So I'm not going to dive too far. Um, and one of those areas is uh, Spring Health, which will be available to PEB members beginning January 1st, 2024, which is very exciting. And again, Dan will get into that a little bit more. Um, and also, we have increased our behavioral health contracted rates over the past few years. And this is something that we are monitoring closely on an ongoing basis to make sure that we're taking changes in the market into account. So we are planning to have increases over the uh, following years as well. Next slide, please. And we also have an open provider panel to all behavioral health uh, provider specialties year round. So as long as a provider can meet credentialing requirements, they are always approved for contracting and we always put them in that workflow. So we really do not deny any behavioral health providers partic participation in our network. Um, something that we also do is we look really closely at out of network utilization. So at least annually, we will do a utilization based analysis specific to PEB members and their utilization to identify providers that they are seeing out of network so that we can attempt to recruit them in. So we will offer them network participation and really try and come in from an angle of improving member experience. So we can say, you know, we've, we see that you're seeing PEB members and we would love to bring you on panel so that it's a better, you know, experience for your patients, really driving home the member experience there. Um, we've also partnered with CAQH, which is the Council for Affordable Quality Healthcare. And this is something that we have done to help expedite that credentialing process and the onboarding for providers. So essentially, it is a credentialing database where providers can sign up for free and put all of their credentialing information in there so that we can go into that database and pull their information. So we're not having to reach out to them for that. And it really helps um, lessen the administrative burden on providers and gets them in network quicker. So that's something that we have implemented that providers have been really responsive to. Uh, lastly, we also, um, if a member requests to see an out of network provider that better meets their needs, and we don't have providers available in our network, we will do in network benefit level exception requests. So it's really important to us that we're ensuring that members get the care that, you know, fits their specific needs, not just a general provider specialty, but one that maybe meets cultural needs or specific services that they need. We really are very sensitive to that and we'll ensure that the members have access to it. Um, and then, you know, once we've identified a provider that is out of network, we will then in turn offer them a provider contract just to, again, kind of lessen the burden and ensure that they're available for other members as well. Okay, next slide. And I am going to pass it on to Dan Toma. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. This whole discussion that, that we've been having really reflects uh, a couple of themes. One, that there's just really a huge crisis in terms of the availability of behavioral health services. There's also a huge uh, sort of world of opportunity for us to, to really kind of transform the way that we do, uh, that we do behavioral health. Uh, in the state and as a as a payer and in terms of our relationships with providers. And um, as a result of that, that convergence of the, the both the crisis and the opportunity, Moda's really decided to make some key investments in behavioral health 
in creating the Behavioral Health 360 program. Um, a piece of that Behavioral Health uh, 360 program, as Melissa mentioned, is going to be available to PEB members beginning January 1st, and that's our partnership with Spring Health. The PEB board decided to adopt that. Um, but there's other pieces of Behavioral Health uh, uh, 360 program that are that are intended to really address this whole um, this whole world around uh, challenges with access, challenges with quality, as Melissa mentioned, um, and our partnership with providers. Uh, and so I want to I want to talk to you about some of those other things that we're doing that um, will be an opportunity for PEB to participate in in the future if um, if you want to do that. Um, so one uh, important piece of that is the behavior health champions. These are dedicated staff um, who uh, will assist a member from beginning to end of the process of uh, seeking behavioral health services. And I think the the example that Sean and Julie were discussing is um, is really uh, a pretty fitting example of the value of the behavioral health champions. We've got partners that have great access uh, on the books, you know, Spring Health, a uh, day and a half. Um, and uh, they've got great, uh, great providers, great diversity, uh, great clinical specialties. But for whatever reason, that uh, experience isn't always going to play out the way it looks um, in a PowerPoint slide. And what we found is that um, at least half of the members who are contacting our behavioral health champions for one reason or another, um, decide not to go with Spring Health and, and go with another, uh, uh, have a different need. Maybe they have a, a child who needs psychological testing. That's not part of that uh, uh, part of that paradigm, or they really want in-person services. Um, and so the behavioral health champions, uh, this, and here, I think this is really a, an indicator of how severe the crisis is. We have a, a member, uh, seeking services. They're not going to go with Spring Health. Champions are typically making anywhere between 10 to 40 calls to set to different providers to find one appointment for that member to, to meet to meet that member's needs. Now think of members trying to do that on themselves who who don't have those lists like because uh, we keep the same kinds of lists like um, like uh, Dustin mentioned with Providence of you know who we've been contacting and what their availability is. Um, so that kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, assistance, that's, that's, that's designed to help us get through this crisis of, of access. But it does more than that as well. Um, we know that uh, once you see a provider, it's not always a great fit. So we're, the champion does that follow-up with the member, whether it's Spring Health or another provider. Um, all right, you had your first appointment, how was it? Does it look like this provider is gonna, gonna be able to help you um, with your needs? And then follow up again, four to six weeks um, into treatment. That by that point, treatment should be working clinically. There, the member should be seeing clinical benefit from it. Is that actually happening? Um, if not, are there other things that we can explore? Is maybe do we need to bring psychiatry in, or is this not the right therapist for you? Or are there social determinants needs that 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 might need to be addressed? So having that um, sort of end to end. Uh, or, or at least making sure that's a you know a successful launch is a key feature of that champion program. We mentioned uh, vendors and Spring Health is is the uh, is is the largest of those vendors um, in terms of the, the impact that it has. Super exciting partnership, um, and really excited about having that available to PEB members uh, starting in January. We also have a couple of additional vendors, uh, Gemini, which offers discrete video modeling, helping kids with developmental disabilities and autism spectrum disorder develop behavioral skills and language skills. Hazel and Betty Ford is a national leader in substance use uh, treatment and resources and is uh, through the BH360 program offering um, additional, uh, additional services to uh, members that participate in that. And then, um, so that, that's sort of a focus on the, the, the service delivery strategy. Uh, another uh, key foundation of Behavioral Health 360 is our provider strategy for that piece of that is value-based reimbursement, which we're gonna talk about more in the next slide, please. Um, 
to uh, we decided that we need to fundamentally reorient our relationships with our providers. And I see that coming from a place where I've always been very proud of the relationships that uh, that we have with our providers. Um, we're also, but we're also in a place where a lot is being demanded of us as a health plan. Providers are overwhelmed. Um, providers don't need to contract with health plans. Um, they can pick and choose. Uh, we're not really in the driver's seat, but we want to transform our system of care to make it more effective and make it uh, meet members' needs better. So one of the first investments in, that, uh, in this was the clinical liaison, which is a new position that we created. We hired an incredible clinician with, uh, with decades of experience, tons of experience with outcome-informed care in training other clinicians with outcome-informed care. Just my, my 30-second uh, soapbox on outcome-informed care, uh, as, as Jeff, our clinical liaison, likes to put it, it's, it's similar to when a thermometer was introduced in medical care. Prior to that, physicians would see, be able to see whether their patient had a fever by observing them, are they flushed? You put your forearm up to their forehead and, you know, and, and sort of get a sense. The thermometer is actually a much better tool than just physician uh, observation in determining what's going on with that patient. Outcome-informed care also goes by name. Feedback-informed informed care, measurement-based care is, um, the research is, is unambiguous. This is what clinicians ought to be doing and what, for the most part, they're not doing. We're in that period before physicians adopted thermometers regularly to, to help them in that way. That's, that's where the behavioral health field is right now. So we want to help move, um, uh, move quality of care in that direction. A couple of the key uh, features of doing that, one is our, uh, our value-based payment initiative. And a second is our new provider advisory council, where we're bringing a group, a diverse group of providers in to help us give us feedback, say, hey, we're planning, we're thinking of going out in this direction. What does that look like from your, from, from your point of view? Um, what are the pain points that you're experiencing? Um, and that council has just been um, incredibly valuable for us, both in forming those relationships and helping us, you know, design our programs in a way that takes the provider's perspective much more readily into account. Um, so the value-based reimbursement program has two primary components. Um, I'm going to do these out of network or out of order from what they are on the slide. One is outcome informed care, which I was just speaking about. This is the process of measuring your patients or your clients progress in treatment and measuring the therapeutic alliance as you go through treatment. That allows you to make adjustments and uh, have, have better outcomes. Um, so we're rewarding providers for, for doing that. Second piece of that is total cost of care, um, in which we are emphasizing the, the uh, alignment between medical and behavioral health care. And um, so, rewarding providers for uh, for behavioral health providers for their role in helping members overall um, phys uh, physical health as well as mental health. Okay, we need to we need to move on. So let's go through uh, go to the next slide. Yeah, and I just uh, want to flag you just have a couple more minutes. So thank you for okay. acknowledging that. Sure. Um, so in a, behavioral and physical health integration, I'll say um, all the things Paul said uh, are are true, other, except that we don't have sort of our our dedicated provider uh, or Providence uh, provider network, but we're integrated both in our contracting, our medical management, behavioral management. Those teams all report up through Dr. Popovich, um, and as I mentioned, the Behavioral Health 360 program is doing uh, is doing more in terms of incentivizing providers in that respect. Um, for, uh, support for primary care medical homes, uh, care management fee that's based on the, the tier of certification that they have. All right, I think I'm ready to turn it over to Erica. Great, thank you, Dan. And I will finish this out. Um, we were asked, uh, next slide, please, Rose. 
Um, we were asked to discuss how we um, collect social determinants of health data and how we use that to recommend behavioral health programs or interventions for members. So there's a couple different ways that we collect this data. One way is that we actually purchase it from a third party that provides hundreds of different SDOH attributes on our members. Another way we collect this data is that we have the um, race, ethnicity, and language disability form, so real D. We have the sexual orientation and gender identity form, or the SOGI, and the CMS accountable health survey forms. Um, we have those in, in our Moda 360 platform. And when a member is working with someone from our care teams, they will um, you know, ask members and kind of guide them through um, taking these forms. And we also have these forms available on our Moda 360 dashboard that members can complete on their own if they would like to. And a lot of times our care team will actually, you know, refer members over to the dashboard because some members kind of like to take those forms um, privately and have more time to kind of reflect on it as they're filling those out. And in those in those forms, like the CMS Accountable Health Survey form, it actually asks some questions about behavioral health, about dep depression and anxiety. And so then what we do with that data is that all feeds into our Moda360 platform, and then it feeds into our health context model, and it gives members a health context score. So we use that to prioritize members for outreach for our different programs, such as case management and our different interventions that our care, our care teams do. It also feeds into what we call our personalization engine. And what this is, is it uses all of that SDOH data as well as, well as all of the other data that we have about our members. And it uses that to prioritize um, programs for our members. Um, we've noticed, I, I think I've, I may have discussed this with you guys before, but we offer between us and PEB, so many different programs and it can be very overwhelming for members because they're kind of getting hit by all of these different notifications all of the time. So what we do is we use that personalization engine to find the top three that we would recommend for those members. Um, so an example of what that would look like is if a member filled out that CMS Accountable Health Survey and indicated some behavioral health needs or wants um, or risks, then that would trigger one of our behavioral health programs to be one of those recommended programs for those members. Um, if you go to the next slide, this is just an example of what it looks like inside of our member dashboard. So this member, um, we have information indicating that they qualify for our C3 program, which waives um, cost sharing for PCP visits for members, and then also assigns them an advocate. So if we had indications on SDOH needs for members um, and that they would qualify and benefit from this program, this would be one of the programs that they would see. And it, since we only have a second left, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Um, members can also see all of the different programs that we offer, including behavioral health. So in this slide, um, I've shown that the member can actually um, search by the category mental health, behavioral health, and it's just gonna show them the behavioral health programs that are available to members. Now, this is an example from another large government account group because Spring Health will not go live for PEB until 1-1, but I wanted to show you what that would look like. So you'll see that Spring Health is that first program there. And so if a member clicked on that, and Rose, if you go to the next slide, it would pop up a description of what Spring Health is. And then if they clicked on that button, it would take them directly to the Spring Health website so that they could engage with that program, register, enroll. Um, we're actually launching an app for Moda360 at the end of September. So when members access the Spring Health inside of that app, it'll give them the option of either going to their website or taking them directly to the App Store to download the Spring Health app or if they already have the Spring Health app on their phone and they're already engaged in therapy um, with Spring Health, they can click on that and it'll just take them directly to the Spring Health app. So they don't have to try and manage and remember all of the different apps that they ha might have for different point solutions. Um, last slide, Rose. This is just an example of those forms inside of our member dashboard. And when members fill out, an example of how we use this too, when members fill out the SOGI forms or the sexual orientation and gender identity, if they indicate specific pronouns, then when their work that members working with our care teams, our care teams can see that they they have requested to be referred to by specific pronouns, and so our care team will actually use those pronouns when they're working with our members um, through care. And um, that is all we have. Uh, any questions for us? Um, thanks for wrapping up quickly, Erica. I know we are running very short on time. I want to give Kaiser their full 20 minutes. Um, and just so everyone knows, we will not do the Joint Health Equity Workgroup update today. We're pushing that off to the next meeting.
So um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Keith Bachman and Michelle Teeples um, to give us their update on Kaiser. And please take your full 20 minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Siobhan and the board. We're happy to be here today to um, answer the questions that you asked of us. And then we do have a third presenter who uh, came in too late for the slide, and her name is Jess Soltes, and she's our director for social health and really a deep expert on how we are assessing social health and how we're using that information to provide better care for our members, both in behavioral health and in general uh, health care. So with that, I will turn this over to Michelle. All right. The next slide. Thank you, Dr. Bachman, and hello, PED Board. I'm glad to be back, and thanks for having me again. As you know, I'm the Senior Regional Director for Mental Health, Behavioral Health, and Addiction Medicine Services with Inside of KP, and then I also liaison and support our contracting providers um, in building our contracted network. So as we work through, I, my, my slides are a lot less um, uh, pretty than what I've been seeing on the other presentations, but I think um, the root of the, the message that we're trying to display here is really that I, there isn't anything that you've heard in previous presentations that would be different here, so I'll touch here on what, um, what KP is doing, but from a network standards um, perspective, and Don, I really appreciated your question about that virtual only provider versus the face-to-face um, -face and what the network actually counts is we're, we're guided by the federal regulatory standards like all the other um, folks that have presented. So really that time and that distance and that geo-mapping, um, but in, and currently it doesn't take into consideration those virtual providers and nor does it really take into consideration diversity or cultural needs or you know gender, um, all of those pieces. So I wanna say, yes, we follow the regulatory and yes, we do have some ga a gap here, but we also do recognize there's um, opportunity within the network um, to expand for other reasons outside of just the standards that are set forth. So from a deficit perspective, um, we identified that we met um, all of the provider um, practitioner to member ratio standards um, with the exception of Lane County. So obviously I don't think this is um, a mystery to anyone. Lane County for psychiatry, especially child psychiatry, has been a gap and that is a gap for us where we sell our insurance there. Um, so to mitigate that gap, I, I reached out to um, our provider contracting team prior to this meeting today and um, asked what's the progress on that. So we have made some progress and have been contracting. We have six providers that do uh, specialize in child psychiatry down in Lane County. So we're, we're working really diligently to close the gap um, in that arena um, at this time. Overall, though, um, similar to other folks that have presented, really we're trying to increase the number of um, employees that we can with inside of our own Kaiser Permanente system and people that work for me um, around psychotherapy and psychiatry. Um, really, again, it's even though we don't call out a deficit there, I think there's an opportunity to acknowledge the diversity of the network is a really important component of it so that members are getting treatment um, just it's surely outside of the time and distance standards, but that we're able to meet the diversity and the cultural needs of our, our members as well. So continuing to add uh, membership there or um, staffing there, expanding our contracting to increase the total number of psychotherapists and psychiatrists. Um, again, for the same reasons there, um, we're, we're full speed ahead in that space. Um, internal efficiency improvements and scheduling. So this is looking at any kind of automation opportunity that we have inside of KP, like how might we, um, automate or expedite patients getting into care quicker or faster? How might we look at um, expanding contracting in an area where we start to see a higher demand? I think sometimes, um, you know, we know our data, we're a very data rich organization as many organizations are and it's what you do with the data and how you look at the data um, to make decisions from an operations perspective. So really thinking about the dashboards, the tools um, that we give our providers to work with. So I heard um, outcome measurement based tools and feedback informed care in the last presentation, all things that we're doing um, both internally and externally to really um, you know, widen that network of providers um, and make them more efficient and hopefully increase access for members. And then increase touch points with our external contracted providers. So a best practice we have here at KP is, you know, at any given time, I know how many members I have in service with Western or Life Stance, for instance, in a psychotherapy capacity. So we meet regularly, quarterly with Western, um, with Life Stance. 
and um, we exchange data information. So I know how many of their providers they have. I know how long it's taking our KP members to get in care with them. I know from an urgent to a routine perspective. And then we're surveying our members that are getting care with inside of these external contracted providers. So we're really wanting to encourage that bi-directional information sharing um, in order to understand the treatment that's happening within the network, but also like how our members are feeling about the care they're getting within the network too. So with that, I'll move to the next slide. So wait lists. So I know I've come and presented before on wait lists and we've talked about it and it is one of those things where it, um, a wait list inside of KP, we use wait lists similar to what I saw presented in previous things as more of a tracking queue. Um, in a lot of spaces and in full transparency, we have these tracking cues in psychiatry, neuropsychiatry, procedural psychiatry. I have it in group, uh, mental health group. I have it in intensive outpatient programs. And then I also have other special cues where I've got a member who has an existing appointment and they're saying, I'm leaving for Europe. I'd like a sooner appointment so I could get my appointment in before I go to Europe or I need a sooner appointment because it interferes with my soccer schedule with my my uh, child. So there's lots of reasons why we have these tracking cues. Um, these tracking cues are screened. So before members land on them, um, it could be their provider left the organization um, and we don't want them to slip through and we want to make sure that we repanel them. So we put them on a queue so that they're cared for by other providers in the interim or the absence of having a panel provider um, and we're able to track them until they get assigned to a new provider. Um, we track members um, from a procedural psychiatry perspective. When you're doing transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, it is very important that you sequence that six week treatment and that you have you know, your most acute members getting in um, in a certain order. And if somebody says they're going to be out of the country for three of the six weeks, you have scheduled treatment plans, um, then we need to rework them back into the schedule when they return from Europe um, because it is not the efficacy of the treatment in order, you know, if it's interrupted with inside of that sequence. So treatment um, tracking cues exist for lots of different reasons, um, and that's why we have them inside of KP. So to mitigate the use of these wait lists, and, I, and I'm going to use neuropsychiatry is, um, or neuropsychology as um, one of these things, uh, expanding contracted provider networks. So neuropsychological evaluations are in huge demand, and I don't think I'm the only um, organization that's seen a huge demand in this in this space. There are a very finite amount of resources that exist inside of the community, and I can say wholeheartedly, KP has contracted with every single one of them, as are probably my partners that are on this call today. Um, and so we have also a very finite amount of resources with inside of KP. Um, so we do have to use an acuity tracking based mechanism to ensure that the patients that have the higher acuity need are prioritized sooner in their neuropsychological evaluations in order not to defer treatment based on clinical um, assessments. So there is sometimes the, the there's not enough resource. And that's why we have to, to screen and queue people up. And then it's merely we want people to enter into a sequence of group appointments um, at, the right, at the right juncture in the treatment plan. Um, other, reason, other ways we're mitigating the use of wait lists, um, filling vacancies of nurse practitioners and psychiatrists. Obviously, I said if somebody leaves, we, we hold on to these patients and we try to match them with other folks. Um, we have to fill those vacancies and we're in the process of doing that. We've been working really heavily with our, this is kind of leaning towards that behavioral health primary integration component, but really educating our primary care teams, all modalities from nursing to medical assistants and providers on how to care for ADHD patients, you know, attention deficit disorder, mild to moderate depression. A lot of this stuff can be managed in a primary care setting um, with adequate medication and adequate support um, liaisoning between our uh, primary care and our mental health specialists. Um, which then reduces the wait list for people who believe that they need um, psychiatric level services for medication management when when many of it and much of it can be managed within the primary care setting with a good partnership between the two departments. Um, also hiring additional psychi psychiatric providers and hiring additional neuropsychiatrists. So we did just actually find two, I call them unicorns. Um, we did hire a neuropsychological evaluation just recently and they're on board with us and we have another one coming in the fall. So we will have expanded capacity in that space. Next slide, please. 
All right. When we talk about contracting, um, it was interesting to hear all the other presentations. So um, thank you for everyone who shared what they're working on. I look at myself in two different lenses. One, I'm the operational um, re responsibility for the internal operations and the employees we hire inside of KP to provide in within our um, KP employees. And then we also, I liaison with a very important and collaborative uh, team in our contracting department to contract within our community providers. So I've got kind of two tracks running when I'm answering this question for you. So challenges do exist in hiring providers inside of KP. Um, I think I just touched on neuropsychology is a, is a pain point and that's region wide. Um, mental health therapists um, from child and family to adults, I feel like they're, um, even though we meet the provider to member ratio from a network standard, I still think there's always opportunity from a cultural response and diversity to look at where we're struggling to meet members where you have somebody that looks like me or has have my lived experiences. And so I feel like there's always a deficit um, down in the Mid Valley area where psychotherapy services are pretty few and far between. Um, psychiatrists and nurse practitioners, I think that's a region-wide thing and been called out by other pre presenters on this. So those are my internal um, challenges. They don't change much when I go to my contracted network. So I look at adolescent child uh, psychotherapy. I look at um, therapists that accept Medicare. I know there's some rules and some changes coming in 24 around who can treat Medicare members, um, but I do think that there is um, a gap when we think about um, psychotherapists that um, accept Medicare um, and are willing to treat Medicare members. Um, psychiatrists and the neuropsychologists, of course, again, are in high demand within the contracted network and actually really hard to find. As far as our strategies internally, obviously we have a very rich benefit package that we offer our employees to um, keep them and retain them and entice them to come this way. Um, with that legislation change, we were not um, afforded the opportunity to continue with sign-on bonuses or anything like that. Um, with the legislation change that happened, I think, at the end of last year. So that's something that we had to sunset, but we do have very competitive medical, dental, and education packages um, and offer uh, competitive wages uh, within the market for my internal employees. As far as the contracted network, we do not offer any benefits or incentives to contract with us. I think you can look at this in two ways. Um, you know, from a non-quantitative treatment perspective and parity, you're always wanting to remain equitable in your reimbursement rates across um, what you're offering one provider to the next. And so I think it's really critical for us as an organization to really be in tune with that and the reimbursement rates that we have in the network. Um, which leads to some of the challenges, right? So if there are other folks that are reimbursing at different rates or have different things going on, and I think Medicaid was a conversation early on as they changed the reimbursement rates for Medicaid in the network um, earlier in the year, um, it led to some questions around um, how folks are, um, how what are the challenges in contracting with people? So I think it's... I'm, no different than anyone else. Um, they're not interested in contracting with a health plan. So I can go out and I can ask them till I'm blue in the face that I would love to have them as part of our panel and they can continue to deny me and say they take, you know, cash credit and a uh, card uh, or checks. Um, uh, provider has a full panel. So even if I wanted them, I think with the neuropsychology folks too, they'll contract with us, but often their panels are super full and they'll tell us, well, I'll have access to take your members in, you know, two months from now, or I can take one this month and two next month. So it's really, they're trying to make space for everybody from Moda to Providence to KP. Um, I think it's just a real big gap in, in, our, in our state um, in that access piece. Providers not accepting Medicare. So um, that is a big contracting component for us too. We wanna make sure that we're not just really hyper-focused on our commercial members, but that we take care of our Medicare um, and that we have um, full spectrum um, of a network to be able to supply everybody. And then sometimes the contractor provider does not accept the reimbursement rate or the fee schedule that we're putting forward. Again, leaning back to that um, non-quantitative treatment and parity. Um, you, you don't wanna go outside of you know, the gap or the range. Um, and sometimes some providers are asking more than what you can reimburse for or what you should reimburse for. So I think it's always, um, you know, a delicate dance when you're trying to expand your network um, and meet all of those things. So with that said, I'll keep us moving. I think, um, you know, our social determinants of health conversation is coming up next, but I'll touch on the physical um, and behavioral health integration. And I know I'm moving really fast and I talk very quickly. Um, so if any, there are questions along the way, I will be happy to address those as we get to the Q&A. So from a behavioral health and physical health integration, I can tell you that Dr. Bachman and I have been partnering on this total mind and body journey on how we can continue to blend the worlds. 
Um, so a lot of these bullet points, and I'll provide some detail behind them, the integrated behavioral health providers in primary care, these are the uh, licensed social, or these are the licensed therapists that um, we have embedded within the medical office buildings that are part of the, the care teams and the interdisciplinary teams with primary care providers. So a great uh, example of this is uh, you come in for maybe a routine um, exam on your toe and it evolves into a conversation about uh, suicidal ideation or you know something in that capacity and we have a therapist right there that we could pull into the room we can have conversation we can work through a safety plan so these are that full integration into the primary care and that's a pretty extreme example those do happen on the regular but there is um, these folks can do anything from needle phobia all the way across the spectrum to um, you know, taking care of, uh, you know, safety planning for our members. Dr. Bachman, I saw you come off mute. Did you want to add anything in that space? No, but I wanted to highlight the depression care management program. Ah, yes, go for it. Touch oh, on it. So this is just a great program that has provided great service to my patients. And I'm confident when I engage a member in this program, I think they get better outcomes than I get in usual care. That involves, involves both nurses and pharmacists working collaboratively with the psychiatrist moving people through uh, basically a, a, detression, a depression medication treatment program can be used in addition to therapy uh, or with behavioral health uh, consultants uh, using an algorithm, using data along the way to make sure people are getting better. Um, and that's just a way of expanding, expanding the capacity of the system and not sort of leaving everything to primary care where things get a little bit chaotic sometimes. So it's just been a great program, structured, um, available to people with both anxiety and anxiety and depression, or I mean depression or anxiety and depression uh, with just great outcomes. So thank you. Great. And then I'll just touch on these. And I'm going to turn over to Jessica really quick. We have about four minutes left. Um, integrated uh, medical record system that allows everyone to see everything across the spectrum. We do all of our routine screening. That is a best practice where we're looking for our substance use and our depression screening in our primary care. We have health coaches. And of course, um, we have an oversight committee that uh, liaisons between the behavioral health department and the primary care setting and always looking for opportunities from a quality perspective and a best practice perspective. So I will go ahead. I know you got the written version. I'm going to punt to Jessica now to touch on the SDOH. So I'll go ahead and say next slide and hand to Jessica. Great. Thanks, Michelle. I'm going to go ahead and flip these questions. I'm going to answer a little bit about how we collect our data, and then I'll go into how we respond to that. Um, so we use several different screeners to get social health information about our patients. Um, Primarily, the two that we use for uh, one for adults is, the, is an epic based social health screener that we've modified internally. Um, and we also have a pediatric um, visit questionnaire that has very similar questions. We focus on the four social health, social, social determinants of health domains of food, financial assistance, transportation and housing um, in those questionnaires. Um, and there's a, there's lots of different ways that we get that out to our patients. We do universal screening where anyone going into a primary care appointment receives um, an electronic version of one of those screeners to fill out before they go into um, an appointment. Um, we do bulk outreach where we identify populations that maybe haven't been screened. Um, and we send out um, email messages to them and ask them to um, to fill out the, the, the questionnaire um, in reach. So we have um, our screeners are all available online. Folks can find it themselves. They can do the screening. Um, and we also, it's not listed here, but in our hospitals, we're screening all of our patients that come into the hospital to um, for social health needs. Um, most of those screeners have a question of whether or not the person wants to um, receive assistance from Kaiser to get connected to social health resources. If they indicate that yes, they would like assistance, um, we have auto referrals that go to the various different teams that respond for social health needs. Um, just a little bit of data around um, PEB respondents. We have um, of the the folks that we've got screened, we've got about 40% of our total population who's been screened for social determinants of health. Of those who are PEB mem members, about 10% of those respondents have indicated um, four out of those four social risks. Um, so it's quite a high number. 
Um, 40% of the, that group of people were at high risk for housing and almost half were at high risk for food insecurity. So it's a pretty big issue um, that we see. That's that's that those numbers are pretty close to what our, our, our membership wide numbers are. So it's not it's not very different than what we're seeing from other members. Um, but just kind of wanted to put it out there that we are finding a lot as we um, as we grow our social health screening. Um, so like I said, once someone fills out a screener, if they want assistance and, and it's, it's very patient driven, so we're not going to reach out to people who aren't interested in um, hearing from us about this. Um, we've got a la layers of different groups that can um, respond. So once we identify, we make the connection. The connection could be um, we've got online tools where folks can search for themselves um, to find uh, community resources. We have a national call number that folks can call into and talk with a person who can help them make those connections. We have a local um, resource access center who's in person in several of our clinics. They're also available by phone and our providers can make direct referrals to this team. And that's a one or two touch connection to community resources, um, either over the phone or like I said, in person if folks come into our clinics. And then for a really high risk, high need folks, um, we have embedded um, community health workers who work with um, caseloads of folks who maybe who need a three month intervention to help get them connected to those community resources, but also help them navigate our system, um, create some behavioral changes and really get them connected in a way that like a one or two touch um, model can't do. Um, I think my time is up, so I'll stop here and see Dr. Bachman, did you want to add something? Nope. Did a great job explaining that. It's real work and it's really happening and it's providing benefit. There's always more work to do. It's when you elicit social needs, there's an obligation to follow up with that. And given the community, the social network in the community being fragmented, it's a it's a big challenge. All right, well, thank you to the Kaiser team for presenting. I know we've been uh, tight on time. This is a rich conversation. I want to draw people's attention to our board packet. Um, each of the carriers answered questions, so there's even more data for you to look over um, if you want to um, check that out. Um, and I think we could see from, I think, the complaint that Sean highlighted uh, through, um, we're seeing a through line where we really are having um, a struggle with enough mental health care providers, and that's real. Appreciate carriers being open with us about the challenges uh, you all are facing um, so that you know we identify problems and we can work on solutions. Um, we had one public comment today. It is in people's email. So I just want to draw your attention to that. It's about us offering the weight loss drugs. I know we have a, some PEB board members along with OEB board members exploring that. So we'll be hearing more about that later this year, but just wanted to um, bring that to your all's attention that that's in your inboxes. Thank you, Rose, for that. And I also want to thank Christy for allowing us to push your presentation to the next meeting. So appreciate everything today. Um, and thank you for sticking with us for a couple of minutes after our appointed time. I know you all are busy. Um, have a good rest of your day. We are officially adjourning today's meeting. Thank Thanks, you, all. everybody. Thank you.